This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to a very cloudy and wet Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands here in South Africa. You can see we've got quite a dramatic skyline this afternoon. We have had a lot of rain overnight and during the day and it seems to still be raining on and off this afternoon. It is a lovely coolish day, quite humid thanks to all of the moisture. But I'm hoping that we might find some predators this afternoon with this lovely weather. My name is Tessa, I'm going to be your guide on safari here this afternoon. Behind the camera is Owen and we've started our afternoon up on quarantine. So we've been looking through all of the trees, we've been looking for any signs of Kara this afternoon because she has been here the last two days, but I think with all the action this morning, the wild dogs, the hyenas, I think she may have moved off and I don't blame her. I think she's gone to a very safe and hopefully dry drainage line. So our plans for the afternoon, we are going to try and find the wild dogs again. We're going to start off going towards Gowrie Dam, which is where the wild dogs went towards. And from there, we're going to be bumbling a little bit further north. It is quite wet and still raining heavily in the south. And so we're going to try and focus a bit of our search this afternoon a little bit further north. So for the first time in a very long time, quarantine is absolutely empty. There are no impalas, no elephants, no wildebeest. And that just shows that we definitely had the wild dogs here this morning. I think the animals are a little bit nervous to make their way back here. But you can hear some birds. There are starlings calling in the background. Some red-billed buffalo weavers. Miss Rowan's class, we are very excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. It is lovely to have you on board. And hopefully you bring the good luck and we don't get rained out and drenched this afternoon. And we might have some good luck with elephants and predators. Because it is lightening up a little bit, we have been seeing a few more insects and birds, mostly the odd butterfly. So I'm hoping we find big and small this afternoon. But we would love to hear from you, so if you have any questions or comments, if you would like to let us know what you are hoping to see this afternoon so we can try and find it for you, please get hold of us. You can find us at hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter. If you're under the age of 18, pop us an email on kidsquestions at wildearth.tv or you can register on the Wild Earth website, head over to the channel page and submit your questions there. Myself and Lauren are looking forward to hearing from you. So while myself and Owen are up here on quarantine appreciating a bit of this view and listening, why don't we take the time to have a little silent moment to start our afternoon. Have a listen if you can hear any bird calls, any sounds of branches breaking or anything like that that might show elephants. Maybe if we're lucky, even an alarm call. Let's have a listen. I can hear the raindrops starting to fall again on our roof. 
<laughs> Luckily we are prepared this afternoon and we've covered everything up already. But while myself and Owen carry on listening for a little while longer and then head towards the dam, let's have a look at what our weather says for the afternoon. Good afternoon everyone. The cars are out and about for hopefully a wonderful sunset safari. Now the rain has been on and off all day. The blue skies appear and the next minute we're hit, and hit with rain. Blue skies hit with rain. So I really don't know what we're in store for, but as you know, we will do our best at this side. This morning was action packed and I had such a good drive despite the weather. It beat us in the end, but that doesn't matter. Good afternoon, my name is Lauren and I do her chat on camera once again. We're at Gary Dam and we're just gonna take it easy today. The further we go, the more risk we have of getting caught. And it's not that we can't get wet or the vehicles can't get wet, but we have a lot of technology that of course can get wet. That's actually the issue. So this morning we were spending time with Navella Swazi and in the belly and actually having the best sighting. I didn't expect any more than what I was having with the hyenas. And then of course the Impala were stotting and running. I thought something's wrong, something's wrong. Look around and lo and behold, pack of wild dogs. I haven't had dogs this entire stint and I was away for seven weeks, so it's been it's been months since I've seen dogs. So it was so wonderful to see them at the end of the day. Don't quite know where they are. I don't know where they went. I think they've moved off because of the rain, but we shall just scratch around a little bit for them and see if we can find them sleeping. It was a pack from the Inbali area. They're mostly young ones, but there are a few individuals like that collared one. It wasn't the Pungwe pack. And I believe they've only been seen on Juma a couple of times. So it was really good to just see them blast across quarantine as dogs do. But we will try to maximize this drive. I don't know where I'm gonna go yet, but I am going to make a plan. So that's what I'll do as I sit here at Gary Dam. Nothing beats sitting around a campfire at night whilst on safari, listening to the calls of the wild and chatting to your guide. If you sign up to be a wild earth explorer, then you can enjoy this from the comfort of your home. Imagine hearing bush stories from your favorite wild earth guide and reliving their highs and lows of a life spent in the wild. Every month, Wild Earth Explorers will be treated to an exclusive fireside chat, special occasions, hot topics and deep dives into the Wild Earth characters. Everything else is just welling up inside of you out in nature. You know, some people think I'm weird, but I have an absolute joy. I have a good time. No, I enjoyed myself thoroughly today. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Wild Earth has grown to know and love many unique wild animal characters over the years that we've been broadcasting live. Recently, we've launched a new initiative to sell non-fungible tokens of these animals to help conserve them. 40% of every NFT sold by Wild Earth will be paid to the custodian of the habitat that each animal lives or lived on. To begin with, we have chosen 25 animals, 11 leopards, including Tingana and Hukumuri. Nine lions, including favorites from the Nkuma and Talamati prides, and five hyenas from the Juma clan, including Ribbon. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the 15th of February, then you will be entered into a prize to win a box set, including one NFT on all 25 animals. Head over to our website to find out more. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. There is clearly something in the vicinity around you 
that's drawn their attention. Yes, that meerkat in the tree is just the coolest of cool meerkats. But watch how, how ba he battles when he comes down. <laughs> that would be like me climbing a tree, just better. We've just realized that our mama squirrel is back. Should I reverse for you? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna reverse. We've been keeping close eyes on her because she's got babies and we have seen them. And she's just popped out to say hello. Oh, she's probably trying to dry off. And this morning with the dogs was a great example of how animals just get wet. There is, oh, battle. Be careful, squirrel. It's a young water monitor, but it could really hurt her. Both claiming this tree is theirs. <laughs> Stand off. Mammo versus reptile. I don't actually think they're fighting everyone. The monitor was lying there. But he won't be happy if a squirrel gets closer. Two of them just staring at each other. This is the same squirrel, I'm sure of it. It is the female, and it is the one that moved her babies the other day, or baby, sorry, did only see one. But she took the baby over to a tree on the other side, but she seems to be spending most of her time here. But we've just been hoping that one day we're going to get lucky and we're going to see her carrying our little baby. We just missed it the other day. Linda Poli, you're saying this is such a oh my word moment. It is very bizarre. That's why it's sometimes good to just stop. But you're right, Linda. This is a very young water monitor. The squirrels may be still in shock after all of that rain. <laughs> but even this morning on quarantine, we just stayed the whole, and we knew it was gonna rain, we just didn't know when. And we just stayed the whole morning with the hyenas and it was worth it because in the end, the dogs came. Sometimes it's good to just sit, sit still and see what comes to you. And I feel like this sighting is bizarre. Sure, Sarah, I, I would imagine so. The lizards haven't had much sun today. In fact, there's been almost none. They're probably low on energy and they both use this fallen over knob thorn. <laughs> so there's very little chance that they are not aware of one another's presence. We've been seeing this squirrel in this tree for about a week now and the monitors are always here. They both utilize this as a habitat. It's a fant fantastic tree, actually. I even use it to mark water levels in my own sort of head. And yeah, I think she would just stand there if it was a bigger one. I'm not entirely what she's doing. Squirrels are normally full of beans. Maybe she's just trying to draw, dry it off. Mm. 
But animals will do all sorts of things to protect their offspring. So maybe she's got her baby back in that nest in the knob thorn. And maybe she's just trying to stop the monitor lizard from getting any closer. The birds are chirping. Everything's coming out since the rain's gone off. It's only just gone off. We didn't even think we were going to get out on time. This shows you how quickly the weather changes here. Okay, I think we're going to stay here just a tad longer, but we are going to send you guys over to Tessa. That certainly sounds like quite the interaction between those two. It's amazing how all of these animals can become so tenacious, so protective. I can't imagine if there was a lizard the size of me, I suppose it would have to be a dinosaur. I can't imagine having a face off with a dinosaur. Well, in essence, that's what the squirrel is doing. Wow. Survival of the fittest, everybody. Survival of the fittest. I can tell you that thanks to the rain. Okay, we're going to head over to Lauren quickly to that interaction. <laughs> A little bit of action there. A lizard got up. Squirrel ran back. Chad said he saw movement in that stump. I didn't see it. But if there's movement in the stump, then it's not mum, which means the young or the baby. I don't know if it's more than one is in there. And that's what she's doing. How fascinating. But the baby that we saw, I'm not able to show you the photo, but... It's tiny, it's very, very small. It's not mobile or any, oh, oh, she goes up, she goes up. Okay, she's gone in. She disappears just like that. There must be a real hollow sort of, hollow sort of tube in there that she can go all the way down and make sure she keeps her baby safe. I hope she doesn't think about bringing them out now. I know my time here, I've never, we have, you know, seen rescued squirrels and orphan squirrels, but never seen this in the wild. That was very cool, I must say. Miss Rowan's class. She's a mama. She's got babies there. That lizard could definitely hurt or even eat one of her very small little babies. They're different species, remember. Not all the organisms out here are friends, I'm afraid, so she's just not very happy that there's an intruder in her nest area in the form of a monitor lizard. 
and he just wants his space. He doesn't want anyone interrupting his routine and his space, which is why he isn't the biggest fan of her. Most mothers in the animal kingdom will do whatever it takes to protect their offspring, whatever they can do. I wonder if she'll come back out again or if that's it. Wild Earth Lover. I don't really know what you mean. Um, you get squirrels all around the world, but there are different species. So just like there are different species of antelope or there are different species of butterfly, you do get... Sorry, I thought I saw a movement there as well, but I think it's just my bad eyesight. There are different species of squirrel. This is a tree squirrel. And in the UK, we get lots of squirrels as well. We get the gray squirrel, the red squirrel, and some of our squirrels can actually be very problematic. Oh, is that her? Yes. Hello again. I thought I saw a movement. So sweet. But yes, there are different species, so... I'm not actually familiar with the species you get in North America, I'm afraid. But this is a tree squirrel. And this is actually quite a petite squirrel. You do get much bigger species. The red squirrel and the gray squirrel in the UK are much bigger. But I'm not familiar with the species in North America. This one's particularly petite. Malaki, generally speaking, the water monitors don't change color. Not like a chameleon, if that's what you're sort of referring to. They can darken normally when they're very, very cold. You'll find that they look a lot darker. Whereas when they're warm and they've seen lots of sun, they will lighten in color. But generally speaking, they don't change color. Nothing like the chameleons. They have the reputation for being the best, but are they? Some lizards can change color, but I believe the water monitor not so much. And of course, age will also play a part. Little juveniles are normally a little bit more colorful than the adults. But once they get older, they sort of dull down a little bit. Isn't that true of us all? I don't think we're going to get to see her babies just yet. Uh, you know that sort of hole a little bit down from the top? That's where I saw movement. So she must have the youngsters stashed way, way down in that stump. And I don't think they're near the surface by any means. I think this is the most stationary I've ever seen a squirrel. <laughs> And squirrel alarm calls have gave us predators before. I found Kalamba once through a squirrel. 
they're not entirely reliable for us. Sometimes they will just vocalize when they're just really not happy. And sometimes they'll vocalize for snakes or big birds. So for us, that's not always helpful. But they do alarm call for predators. Something like that. And you can find predators, but it's not always the best alarm call to rely on. We're just going to sit here by Gary Dam a little bit longer. At Wild Earth, our explorers are treated to a weekly newsletter, bursting with fascinating features and never seen before snippets. Recently, we have added some brand new sections which we think you will love. Find out what happens behind the scenes with our crew when they are not live on Wild Earth. Have a giggle at our moments of the week from both Safari and Penguin Beach. And Ranger Steph answers your questions with fascinating and in-depth explanations as to the whys and hows of nature yards away from one of the most endangered species. All of this and more delivered to your inbox every week. So what are you waiting for? Head over to our website, sign up to be an explorer and join the adventure. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Wildlife trafficking remains a growing problem in South Africa and often made worse by the way the media portray this complex issue. WESA, the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, in partnership with WWF South Africa and supported by USAID, have recently embarked on a program whereby they train reporters to better tell stories of wildlife trafficking. In my community, wildlife conservation is mostly something other people do, and I would like to change that. My name is Iman Singli. I told people I met that the pangolin is one of the most trafficked animals on the planet. But what is a pangolin, they said. Why is it in danger? This is what made me decide that the pangolin story must be told. If we are to play a part in preventing the extinction of this animal, then we must all be part of the battle. A partnership between WWF South Africa and WESA, supported by USAID. So there we go, there we go, look. All three in one frame. <laughs> Look at that, isn't that cool? Oh, that is so special. That is exactly what we had been hoping for, is all three of them to come together and make the perfect little family portrait. So we've actually found something a little bit different this afternoon. We've been looking for elephants. We've been seeing a few signs of them, odd branches broken here and there, some tracks, some trees that they've been pulling branches off of. But this I actually found in the road. It's a little bit dirty from the rain. I think the rain's been moving the sand around on the stick. But this has been chewed by an elephant and fairly recently as well. It's not an old branch that's been chewed by an elephant. It's quite fresh. And what I wanted to show you is what they actually do with these branches. This would have been taken off of something maybe like a marula. It does look like a marula branch right on the end. And they actually turn it around in their trunk. So they put it in the mouth and it rotates from end to end. So I don't really want to have to demonstrate in my mouth, but basically put it in on one side and turn it and turn it and turn it all the way through the mouth until it comes out the other side. But what I wanted to show you is actually the tooth marks on this branch. So if you have a look over here, you can see the bark is still intact, but there's a little patch here that's got no bark and a little patch there that's got no bark and then big patches where there's no bark. So the bigger patches is actually what they want because they're trying to get the bark off completely. And here they haven't quite 
kind of carried on with it. So what they've ended up doing is chewing but not getting all the bark off. And this is actually from a tooth. And that's from a tooth. As it's rotating, it's the same size. So I would say this is a fairly young elephant. It's not a massive elephant. And it's been moving it through. And this is from one tooth just taking a chunk of the bark off. And then it rotates a little bit and it takes the next chunk off. You can see that chunk is about the same size. And that's what it's doing, just to try and get to the under layer of the bark. So I'm going to take a little piece of the bark off in between. It's a very thin piece, so I'm going to try and move the canvas for you. Very thin bark. But what they're looking for is in the middle of the bark layer is a layer called the cambium layer. And that's the layer of the tree that gets the water from the roots all the way up to the leaves. And it also transports through photosynthesis in the leaves a lot of food is produced. It transports that back to be stored throughout the different parts of the plant. And so what they're trying to do when they take the bark off is mostly get some water, but it also provides roughage in the form of this bark that's coming off. It helps their stomachs work, so it helps the digestive system, but it also helps them get a little bit of extra nutrients. And this was quite interesting because you can see it very nicely, especially on a marula fruit. It's got a very orangey red hue in the sun especially there. If I actually rub it, it's starting to come off red on the cover of the car for the rain. And it's got a very reddish color to it. So this one is nice and fresh, and it just shows what an elephant has to do to get all the different elements of its diet in at the same time. So it'll eat on things like the roots of the marulas, the marula fruits themselves, the branches to try and get the bark. And this is why elephants ring bark trees on the main stem and it'll even have to do grasses, flowers, all of those things on the herb layer as well. So there's a massive diversity to an elephant's diet. But this has always been one of the most interesting techniques when they can put it in their mouths and they actually rotate it as they're chewing just to try and get all of the bark off and that leaves a few of the tooth marks behind and the flaking bark coming off where it's been loosened but not actually eaten and it's actually still wet inside. So it's very, very interesting to see a branch like that. I actually found it in the road and I wanted to pick it up and show you what it looks like. So that is also, you can imagine, if you're an elephant and you're chewing bark like that, you're chewing big chunks of very, very hard substance, you're gonna struggle with your teeth. They're gonna be ground down, the bark is very rough, but also there's dirt and things in the bark. It's quite a thick layer. The tree inside itself is very hard. And so all of that pressure on the elephant's teeth is why elephants have adapted to having six sets of adult teeth in their lives. It's very, very fascinating. And that's the best way to age an elephant is to look at those teeth. So just a little side story for you to show you what we found because we have been seeing such fresh signs of elephants particularly along this road. We're on Impala Road and we've been seeing some tracks and the odd quarry that's been squashed. They don't really even eat quarries. I think it just got a bit frustrated and squashed the quarry. And the odd branch like that strewn along the road. We can actually see as well, there are tracks of the wild dogs here, but from before the rain. Whether that was before the rain this morning, before Lauren found them, or before the rain this afternoon, I'm not sure. It's very tough to say. But at least we have got some tracks, and it's nice to know that they were here. We can also tell from looking at the other animals around, there's no impalas. Susan, yes, it's actually one of the most common causes of death in an elephant is not fighting or anything like that. It's the fact that they die of old age. It's one of the few animals out here that consistently dies of old age, one of the few species. And that's because as the teeth are getting ground down, when you're in your sixth set, so you're between say 50 and 60 years old or just over 60 years old, you've got your sixth set of teeth. There's no more teeth to replace them. So if your teeth are getting ground down and there's hardly any left you won't be able to ring bark a tree and actually process the bark to get the water you won't be able to eat the bark just to get some roughage in your system but even things like leaves and grass stems they're actually very hard to digest because of the cellulose in the plant walls and in the structure of the plants it's a very difficult um, parts to digest and the digestion process starts with your teeth. Even for humans, if you haven't chewed your food properly, your stomach can't process it properly. 
and now they can your intestines. So for elephants, if you don't have teeth, unfortunately you can't start breaking down the outside layer of the grass or the bark or anything like that. And if you can't break the outside layer, your stomach and your chemicals in your stomach and your digestive process will not actually be strong enough to break the outside wall. So it's going to come out completely whole, which means you've eaten it for nothing. And that's actually what led to the concept of an elephant graveyard. It doesn't actually exist. They don't go to the same place to die. They are known for being very sentimental. They will go visit the carcasses or the bones of elephants in their family that have died. But they don't go somewhere specific to die. The difference is when you've got no more teeth, you can't eat bark, you can't eat leaves, you can't eat most of the stuff you used to. And so what they end up doing is going towards water holes because the plants near the water holes are softer, so they're easier to digest. And also they're trying to fill themselves up on water. And so that's how most elephants actually die of starvation in their old age. Very sad process to see. A little bit of biology lesson on elephants there. I like it. I mean, as is with an elephant's teeth, they're very big. An elephant's back molars are massive. They're the size of my mouth. But, um... <laughs> Fiona, you're most welcome. I'm glad I could, could give a little bio lesson on the digestive process of an elephant. But um, you'll even find that elephants, because their teeth are so big, because they are so big and they've got to eat such a range of different plants, almost 60% of the plants that they ingest come out completely whole, untouched, because they don't chew it well enough and it comes out the other side completely whole. So 40% can actually be used by the body, digested and then converted into energy. So that's why an elephant is constantly feeding. It's, it can't take a break from feeding. So elephants don't really sleep much. They're constantly moving around so that they've got new food and water all the time. And that's also why if you find a big pile of elephant down, you'll find whole pieces of grass, whole twigs, whole marula fruits. And that's why they're so popular. Dung beetles love it. A lot of bird species will eat that. Some mongoose species will dig through the, the scat or the poop, the dung. So it's a very interesting process. Elephants are actually not that good at digestion. But it's a trade-off because the body is so big, less energy goes towards digestion and more towards just keeping the whole body functioning. Whereas with something small like a squirrel, it can eat a few high content or high quality items and it'll be fine for the day. Because it's small, there's less energy going to other things, less, less to maintain, if that makes sense. And that's a, in fact the same concept that leads to elephants having to have adaptations to keep themselves cool. Your surface area to body ratio is completely off. Miss Rowan's class, I wish I actually had a skull to show you how big an elephant's teeth are, but I'll click these stops so that we can get a nice idea. Young elephants, their teeth are kind of similar to our molars, so smallish. But a big elephant, a big elephant bull, its teeth, the big molars at the back are about that long. So a good few centimeters long, and they're very, very deep into the skull itself. So an elephant's skull is very big. It actually grows into its teeth. So a baby elephant in its skull, how we have milk teeth and then our adult teeth are up above our gum layer in the skull. Elephants have six layers of those put up into the skull. So it's quite a process. <laughs> Elephants are absolutely fascinating. All of these adaptations just so that they can be the size that they are. And live as long as they do. They are the longest living out here for the mammals. I'm actually in one of their favorite areas. I'm in one of the seep lines. I'm going towards Treehouse Dam and there's a lot of bush willow here and bush willow is very sweet. So elephants really do enjoy that. So I'm hoping that we are going to find some elephants. I'm happy that the rain is hold, held off for now so that we're not rushing back to try and find shelter. And hopefully the animals will be coming out as well. But it is lovely to see the bush so lush and green and wet. All the grass is still dripping. And the flowers are starting to open, so I'll see if I can find you some. And 
animals are fascinating creatures. That's why I'm a firm believer that animals are much more adaptable than humans are. They have to be, otherwise they won't survive. Where we have, as humans, we've developed a world around us to make our lives easier instead of animals which have to develop themselves to adapt to the world around them. We've done it the opposite way around. So we get less adaptable because we just make things that adapt for us. interesting concept. We could talk about it for hours, but let me not do that. I'm going to head on towards Treehouse Dam and hopefully I might be able to find some elephants there. to start off. Bright colors and it attracts the insect to the flower, which is exactly what we're watching right now. This is so exciting. Oh, good. Hi. Hi. The smallest baby blackback jackal I have seen in the wild. Look how full the belly is. <laughs> it is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin. They just make me feel alive. That is incredibly sweet. Grooming each other. Play is vital. This is how they learn. This is how they would tackle prey. There you go, there you go. Heart is pumping right now. Look at this, everybody. We got a live kill. There's nowhere to go. It's just such an incredible privilege to be out here. It just keeps on delivering. Going for the youngster? She got it. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. This is insanely good footage. Start, which is why we are in the same position. So, <laughs> we are going to sit by the dam for a while and make a plan, but you will not believe it. That squirrel ran and attacked the monitor lizard, and the monitor lizard ran and just dived into the water. Freestyle, into the water. Welcome back, yours. And that is a mother. That is a mother protecting. Absolutely, season. Protecting his offspring. That's just fierce. A squirrel attacking a lizard. It's just unbelievable. So, yes, we'll make a plan on how to get Wendy started. Dear old Wendelin, she just does not want to participate anymore. At least we're on the damn wall. Could be worse.
Um, I didn't catch that name, I'm afraid, but I absolutely will look for giant land snails. I have not seen any, but after the rain, as you know, land snails come out. And they're also one of my favorite things to see. They are utterly fascinating animals. Although they're slow, they should not be underappreciated. I know a few of you also love them. So I absolutely will look out for them 100%. Once I can get my car moving, we shall do that. But normally after the rains, once it starts to dry up like this, you normally see lots of different organisms come out and snails are definitely one of them. So I'm gonna take a look at Wendy, see what we can do. <laughs> you guys are going over to Tessa, who's got the mobile vehicle. Stuck in the brain, it's stressed though. <laughs> oh, Wendy, old girl. <laughs> Good luck, Lauren. I hope you get her started. I have that feeling of impending doom when you're about to get stuck. I have that feeling. After all of this rain, you've got to be very careful which roads you drive. And I have a feeling that it might be Rusty's turn to get stuck this afternoon, but I don't want to jinx myself, so don't, don't do it, Rusty. Don't do it. <laughs> been looking for a few birds we haven't actually seen as many birds but I can tell you very happily that we've seen at least six butterfly species Yes, it will definitely affect um, how animals act, move, how they function, weather like this. Because you can imagine, for predators it's an advantage. They are looking for conditions where their scent, their smell and the, the sight of them can be covered up because they need to be able to give the element of surprise and they need to be not too hot when they're hunting. So normally this is why animals are nocturnal. Hello Impala! You can see things like the herbivores are quite nervous. So predators that would normally hunt at night, lions, leopards, they would be much more active on days like today. Things like wild dogs would 100% take advantage of weather like this, which they did this morning. It's the perfect, perfect weather for it because they're not too hot and because they... Oh, OD, no, never mind, it's flying away, brown snake. But things like impalas, because they are prey species, Okay. The rain covers the sound and the smell of the predator's approach. Ah, oh, got again. Um, but it also means on windy days they know that predators can use that to their advantage to be downwind. So on days like today you'll find impalas, wildebeest, kudus, all of the animals that are prey species. They would be much more alert, much more skittish, much more nervous. And preferably, if they can, depending on the species, they're either going to be hiding deep in the drainage line and trying not to move at all so they don't attract any attention, or they're going to be up in the clearings like Quarantine or Impala Plains where it's open and they can see further so that they themselves are a little bit more at peace knowing they can see something coming from a distance. But of course, different predators use different strategies. So predators will be more active, herbivores will be much more nervous, which is why we can't get a still shot of an impala this afternoon. Things like birds, they struggle to fly and they struggle to um, hunt in the rain because it weighs them down with their feathers and they need to be able to fly. Things like elephants, rhinos, buffaloes, they actually quite enjoy this weather because they're not going to get as hot. They've got very dark skin, it's usually quite thick. So they would struggle and get hot and they'd have to hide out in the shade on a very hot day and not move around as much or they'd have to mud wallow. On a day like today, they don't have to hide from the sun. They get a nice cool breeze going over their body. They get rained on so it cools them down, it washes them. And so they might actually be more active. They might be everywhere. So it really does affect everything. Even insects like butterflies, if it's raining hard, they can't fly that easily. Their feathers are made up of very tiny little scales that are quite fluffy. And you can imagine if that gets wet, it's gonna weigh you down. So they need to be as light as possible. So it really is quite a, um, quite a thing. Everything changes its behavior. Raptors though, raptors are normally quite active. I have actually just noticed one. 
the top of a tree, and I'm wondering what it is, but it's very backlit, so I'm hoping Owen can get it. Yay, the roof didn't get in the way. Rusty, you're making a noise. So you can see it just at the top of the tree there, looking out, enjoying the view. That is so backlit. <laughs> and you can actually hear a squirrel alarm calling in the distance. Have a listen. So that's the squirrel getting very unhappy with the fact that there is a bird of prey right here. They're just grabbing my binoculars. Let's have a look. Oh, it looks like a Warburg's eagle. You can see the little crest. It is very backlit, so it's tough to see any distinct coloration from this side, but it looks like a Warburg's eagle in size and in that little crest. So this is quite a bit smaller than the brown snake eagle I spotted earlier, but still a formidable predator. Normally in pairs, but I think there is a pair that nests close to Philemon's, Philemon's dip treehouse dam. So maybe the partner is around. Struggling to balance on such a thin branch. So that squirrel alarm call is something that we use to help us find animals, whether it's birds of prey, like this Warburg's eagle, or even something like a leopard. A squirrel will alarm. And you can hear it's quite consistent, so it's not giving up. So I'm very sure that the birds of prey are going to be out in force this afternoon. And that's a combination of this Warburg's eagle enjoying a bit of the sunlight to dry its feathers. Jasmine, raptors are very big. Uh, it depends on the specific raptor. So Warburg's eagle is closer to around 60 centimeters tall, so just over two rulers. That's pretty big, but that's only about three kilograms. Remember that birds are very, very light for their size. So hunts a baby impala, you'd have to be something more along the lines of a martial eagle, which is closer to 85 centimeters or so, just under a meter tall. And they weigh maybe five or so kilograms. Um, but they can pick up and carry prey of more than eight kilograms and that sounds very similar to a baby impala So they certainly will will give it a go if they get the opportunity And on days like today when you can use the Sun you can realign your feathers like that Eagle's been doing preening a bit Sitting right at the top of a tall tree you have an advantage with height and because the impalas and things are hopefully going to be in a clearing you'll be able to see them from a distance so it's a great day for eels to be hunting. That being said, taking down an impala is quite a feat. Um, and so most of the time, eagles will go for much smaller items. Squirrels, snakes, lizards, Wahlberg's eagles, and tawny eagles in particular actually go for termites a lot, which sounds a bit strange. But that's actually why we see a lot of the eagles out after the rain, is because they're looking for alates, termite alates. And alates are basically the new kings and queens of colonies, when they have rain, it prompts them to leave the colony. So they'll be inside the colony, they have wings, we call them flying ants as a nickname. It's actually termites. I'll see if I can find some for you. And then you have something called a termite eruption, where all of these alates, you'll have hundreds of them coming out of a termite colony because so many end up being killed. They're used as a massive food source by a lot of animals even scorpions, um, there's this eruption after the rain because that's when the soil is softest, it's easier, to, easiest to kind of manipulate and develop a new termite mound when the soil is nice and soft. And these alates take off in force. They crawl out of the holes in the termite mounds, they take off and it's like this eruption of fairies almost, that's what it looks like. And then you'll find all sorts of animals waiting at the termite mounds. So this could very possibly be a Warburg's eagle waiting because there are active termite mounds very, very close by. And that's when you'll find, you know, things like scorpions on the ground, hornbills, starlings, eagles, even things like mongooses will be really focused around areas like that because the alates are so high in protein. 
And so it's a really good food source. So majority of the time, eagles are actually eating things like invertebrates, insects, and then very small mammals and reptiles, not as much. <laughs> My mic pack seems to be playing up after the rain a bit. Sorry, everybody. So this eagle is looking very nice and relaxed and what is nice to see is that the sky behind we're actually getting a bit of blue sky through there so there is a little bit of light after the storm <laughs> that squirrel is not happy with this eagle but look at the clouds building on the left there it's quite an unusual sky today so we're definitely expecting a bit more rain i think this rain is actually due to go on through next week Okay, so while we just take in the scenery a little bit, I think it's a good time for us to just spend a little bit of time listening. Chance to win unique, never before seen t shirts whilst playing an animal ID game on our new Discord channel. Sign up for free and click on games to find the animal ID game. Every time an animal is posted by a mod, you guess the species and in some cases the individual animal's name. The fastest correct answer will be put into a draw to win a t shirt that cannot be bought anywhere. Prizes will be awarded every single day. Head over to our Discord channel now and join the animal ID fun. Guys, just watch what's happening. See, watch the elephant, watch the lions. See, the first ones to run are the cubs. Okay, you see them? They are right here. I'm not sure how scared you were, but I was quite nervous. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth daily. My favorite animal is a leopard, purely because I just think they are just the epitome of feline grace and power, and the way they can move about in any environment and remain hidden until they want to be seen, I just find it incredibly intoxicating, and they're amazingly beautiful. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. We got our start aid. Something to do with the immobilizer. I don't know what that is. But anyway, <laughs> we got our start aid, so we'll see how we go. The dog tracks actually go all the way along Central, and I think they cut up Gary Cutline, which makes me think they're heading to Bubasuk. We lose the tracks. We scratched around a bit, looked in the block, but I mean, if they're lying down in that drainage line, we won't see them, but luckily it is cool. I mean, it's not cold, but it's cool. And if they didn't successfully hunt this morning, which they may have after we left them, then they may get mobile pretty soon. But whether they'll come back down this way, I do not know. I love dogs when they're a surprise. I've had quite a few sightings when you don't know they're on the property. And you either say, dogs, or you can smell them. There are dogs here, and you find them. I love that. I mean, when you know they're on the property, it's obviously just as exciting, but it's always a bit of a mission. I love when they just surprise you, and they just blast onto quarantine. 
and you just feel so lucky to be with them for that short period of time. After spending time with the Ethiopian wolf, I really have such a, an appreciation for these animals. Canids, and part of the Canidae family. There are only 34. The last canid to go extinct was the Falkland Island wolf. And they're thinking that if things don't improve, the Ethiopian wolf is going to be next. And it is the most beautiful, beautiful animal, really. Uh, we hiked up to 4,000 meters. That was fun. <laughs> to stay in a tent at the top of the Bali mountains just to see the wolf. And you can really feel the altitude. You can feel just, you're not, I'm quite, well, I like to think I'm fit. I, I work out to try and stay fit, but when you're at the top of the mountain, you can really feel your fitness goes, it's hard to breathe, but it was all so, so worth it. Even in the morning when you open your tent, the ice, you have to crack off the ice, it's that cold. And then of course it warms up very, very quickly. And you just go walking across the vast plains to look for the wolf. You can walk them on foot. We had our first three days on foot. And one of the local expert guides said to us, Lauren, I think you guys should get horses. And I thought, okay, let's do it. Mine was more of a pony, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm a small human and my pony did not want to do much, did not want to be a pony. So there's Davi galloping across the plains and then there's me going, come on now, come on now. My pony would just not move, but anyway. The, ho the wolf sees the horse but doesn't recognize or identify that there is a human on the horse, just like the vehicle situation. So if we get out on foot, Tangana will run, but if we pull the vehicle next up to Tangana, he doesn't mind. So it's a similar situation and you can get really, really close to the wolves on horseback and they're just the most lovely, lovely animals. They don't hunt cooperatively like wild dogs do. They can do, they can take down a mountain in Yala, which you should Google. That's quite a quite an antelope right there, but they tend to hunt solitary and they go for rodents. I think it's like 95% of their diet is rodents. From your small little rats to field mice to your giant mole rats. And the way they hunt them is just remarkable. It's very special to watch that. Lilypan, you're saying you wish you could travel the world for nature. You should if you can. But if not, I will always share my adventures with you. I love it. I love it. I feel very lucky to have seen the wolf. And I also feel very, very sad that that's happening to the wolf. And the Ethiopians are the most wonderful, beautiful people. And they don't harm the wolf. They don't hunt them. They are not directly killing the wolves. It's a combination of many things. And the main thing is habitat loss from indirect human pressure. So Ethiopia actually has one of the fastest growing populations in Africa. It's out of control. So there's no space left for people to go. So people are starting to move up the mountains and with people comes agriculture and comes building houses and communities, using up the land, bringing cattle. So as the humans go up, the wolves go up. Their space is getting smaller. And of course, cattle destroy the land, destroy the grazing, which affects the giant mole rats. The movement of the giant mole rat then affects the movement of the wolf. Second problem is that men, human, come with their canine best friends, which is wonderful for us. My dog meant the world to me, but in Ethiopia, sometimes they come with canine distemper, rabies. And just like African wild dog, Ethiopian wolves, just the populations just got hit so badly by these diseases. So there's an organization up there now trying to vaccinate them all. There are only 500 left. How do you, where do you start and trying to protect them? They're endemic, they're highly specialized. Smell a hyena. We are near the den. Miss Kaya is active. I'll be joining you there shortly. Anyway, again, 
humans are not hurting them, but they're taking up their land and they're also pushing them up to the top of the mountain in tiny little pockets, fragmentation. And of course, they're spreading diseases through their domestic dogs. And thirdly, the wolves have just become victims of their own success. They are so specialized now in hunting the giant mole rats because of indirect human pressure that now their diet is almost too specialized. They're not going, they're not flexible anymore. They're not adaptable to different scenarios. Where are you going to put them? What diet are they going to take if you now sort of move a pack into a different location? Last problem, there are many, they can actually with domestic dogs, African wild dogs cannot. So you won't find African wild dogs mating with domestic dogs, but the wolves can. And naturally, the naturally they can produce viable offspring and when they produce viable offspring it's obviously a hybrid and they're threatening their own genetic integrity and when you're in the valley mountains you can actually see some canines that you think that looks hybrid it's a mix between a domestic dog and an ethiopian wolf which sounds beautiful but at the end of the day the wolves are losing their genetic integrity because of that it's a fascinating story and i really hope we don't lose the ethiopian wolves they're really really stunning animals Beautiful call, beautiful behavior, also social tight-knit units. But they are next on the list to go. Seriously threatened with extinction. They're the guardians of the rooftop, the roof of Africa. Okay, this might be a little bit difficult to navigate because there is another vehicle here. It's a very tricky downside, this one. It doesn't really leave room, but we're going to try and view them through this spot. Oh, okay. It's been called in as active, I'm afraid, but it's not active for us, I think. Are there any adults? No. Okay. So we're going to pull out. <laughs> oh, sorry, have you got no view? Okay. It's actually just a wild earth thing. Vehicles to view them. Anyway, we shall come back. We do know where all the adults were this morning. But the three little monkeys in there look fine and dandy. Okay, disappointing, but that's okay. I think we're going to check the eastern boundary and see what that brings us today. With the launch of Wild Earth's Genesis collection of non-fungible tokens this week, we thought it would be a great time to take a trip down memory lane. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you can join Lauren and Tess at the fire for a special look back at some of the animals in the first collection. From seeing Tandy save her babies from the baboons, to the first time we spotted Klongile. There's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Guys, guys, Karula has brought her cubs to Juma. We've been tracking her. Isn't this amazing? It promises to be a real tearjerker. Wild Earth is launching this NFT collection and others in the future to find an alternative way to fund conservation. Join us straight after the Sunset Safari on Saturday the 29th of January for an unforgettable fireside chat. Cape Nature is the chief custodian of the Western Cape of South Africa's natural environment. This highly successful organization strives to conserve the province's natural heritage to ensure a sustainable future. Besides nurturing nature, Cape Nature offers an authentic ecotourism experience to local and international visitors. And one of these experiences is walking amongst the penguins at Stony Point, or as we know it, Penguin Beach. Wild Earth broadcasts live from here every day 
and is very privileged to be partnered with Cape Nature who have focused their conservation efforts here. If you want to visit these iconic black and white African penguins for yourself, then head over to our website to find out more. Cape Nature. Conserve. Explore. Experience. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. One of my absolute favorite sounds in the bush, which we often hear in little marsh areas, but particularly at dams like Treehouse Dam, is bubbling casinas. And there you can hear them. It sounds like bubbles popping. It's actually a frog species. But it sounds as though there's bubbles coming up from under the water and popping as they reach the surface. One of the most iconic sounds out here. We have got a bachelor herd of impalas that are just enjoying a bit of the open area just above the dam. But uh, it seems like mostly everybody is quite calm at the moment. Insects, frogs, birds, mammals, everybody's out and making themselves known for now. But we are getting crept up on second by second by a massive thunderstorm in front of us. So I think these animals are taking advantage of the calm before the storm. You can hear the thunder. So it is quite... <laughs> Sorry everybody, some tech issues there. It is quite a, um, a lovely temperature at the moment. With the scene in front of us, it's cooling down because of the storm approaching. And so the animals are really taking advantage of that. We have seen the odd bird around there. You can see our resident blacksmith lapwing from Treehouse Dam. It seems like this is the place to be this afternoon. Even Mr. Warthog made an appearance. If you actually have a look, it's, it's a very deceiving skyline today. Alice, um, bubbling casinos are actually very beautiful. So I hope you do get to see one at some point. Let me see if I can find it for you in my one book. But while I do that, we can have a look at Mr. Warthog, who's over on the other side there. I'm actually not sure. I'm not sure if it'll actually... But it is, it's, it's so interesting how just before the storm, all of the animals come out. And so everybody seems to be really just enjoying, enjoying their time. Okay, there, I found it, Owen. I hope there's no strange noises. I'm just moving my mic back. <laughs> so this is a bubbling casino, Alice. Oh, and I'll zoom in on it for you. It is quite a stunning frog species. You can see very distinct striping down the body. And it's almost like a light sandy color. It looks a little bit rubbery because it's always got a nice wet layer over the skin. But what's very striking is these two spots above the eyes and then this very dark streak down the back and down the sides. Very typical of a bubbling casino. 
and it's usually actually the males that are calling. So there are a variety of different frog and amphibian species that you would find here, but bubbling casina is definitely the most prominent sound that we hear from frogs. Very, very pretty. Oh, what have you got, Evan? Some movement in the water. That's a terrapin. No, oh, sorry, FC, I didn't quite get that. If you could please repeat the question from Heather. We seem to be having the odd communication issue because of the storm, I think. Heather, <laughs> you want to know frogs can vomit out their stomachs. They can certainly regurgitate food if they need to, because they eat a lot of insects, they might get stuck every now and then. I think certain species would do it as a defense mechanism, but it's not, I don't think it's as common as you would think, but if, I'll see if I can look that up. My, my memory seems to be failing me a bit there. <laughs> so I'll see if I can figure that out for you. <laughs> there seems to be a terrapin that is really enjoying the vegetation just on the edge of the dam and I'm not sure if it's actually looking for the vegetation itself or if it's just getting some of the aquatic invertebrates that are localized to the vegetation using it for cover. Goodness gracious, the whole plant is moving. Maybe it's trying to eat a little bit of the root layer. Or maybe it's trying to get its its little beak. <laughs> the predatory one or not as much. Most terrapins are predatory, but you will get some that feed on plants as well. Good find, Owen. Thank you. That's lovely. <laughs> Those bubbling casinos are one of my favorite noises. I actually can't get over it. Sorry, you will hear a little bit of movement every now and then, everybody. We're just um, every now and then repositioning something for the rain. That sky is so deceiving, it looks so beautiful. There's a massive storm coming from the other side that you can't see. Hello, Impalas, are you coming down to drink? But it's lovely, there's so many ox peckers to see it today. I am having a few communications issues. I know there is a first grade class asking a question about why there is a bird on the impala. And that bird is called an oxpecker. You'll find them on impalas, on giraffes, on buffaloes, on a variety of different animals. And what they're actually doing is they're looking for food on the impala. So you can see it's busy moving over the impala's body, starting from its neck, going down the legs. It might go up the stomach onto its back and these ox peckers will feed mainly on ticks. Ticks are small parasites which suck the animal's blood and 
the ox pickers are looking for that blood. So what they do is they hop all over the impala's body, especially thin areas like inside the ears and the nostrils, anywhere that there's a bit thinner hair in all the joints. And they put their beak through the impala's fur until they feel a tick which is attached to the impala's skin. They then pick it off and feed on it. So they're actually doing a little bit of pest control for the impala. They're also an excellent early alarm system. They've got very good eyesight, so they might see a leopard coming before the impala does. And they'll warn everybody. But um, at the same time, obviously, just getting rid of those parasites because parasites can carry diseases that the animals can get. So they're getting food from the impala, and the impala is getting a little bit of pest control and an extra safety barrier from them. Every time you can hear ox peckers calling, you know there might be some bigger animals close by. You'll never find them on things like elephants or predators, though. They don't tolerate them at all. But I think they would also be a bit nervous to try and eat a tick off of a leopard's ear. I would be. They've heard something. Have a look at that. Definitely heard something. So, Heather, just to let you know, um, you asked about frogs vomiting out their stomachs. Some species do do it, um, but only when they're adults. So, it allows them to to kind of get rid of anything that might be poisonous. You can imagine there might be a lot of poisonous butterfly species and beetle species, those kinds of things, because they may die as insects.
Apologies for the technical difficulties, everybody. I think the storm is playing havoc here. We've got some gremlins with us on drive today. But we're back. We're still at Treehouse Dam. And I was busy chatting about frogs for Heather. And yes, frogs do expel their stomachs. I don't think all species do it, but some definitely do. And it just helps them get rid of some of the toxins because they swallow their prey whole. If they swallow something like a poisonous beetle or anything like that, it does mean that they want to get that out of their system so they can actually expel their stomach. Some species will actually clean the stomach with heat just to try and get the layer off from the inside of their stomachs. So yes, they can expel their stomachs. Thank you for testing my knowledge. But I don't know if you actually knew you could actually also swallow using their eyes.
Thank <laughs> you. 
Body, the gremlins are out to get us today, and it seems like they don't like me talking about frogs. Apologies, Heather. Third time lucky. Let's see if we can get through the whole thing. <laughs> yes, frogs can expel their stomachs, and they need to do this, for example, if they've swallowed something toxic. So, quite a few beetle species, some locust or grasshopper species, things like that, can be toxic. That's usually why they have bright coloration. And so if a frog lurches itself at something, it will swallow it whole normally, which is actually better in this instance. And then to expel those toxins or clear out the stomach if something is stuck, they can bring it out, clear it of all of the food, and they can actually use their feet to rub the inside of the stomach to get everything off. So it is quite an interesting process, and they actually, believe it or not, use their eyes to help them swallow. Because they swallow their prey whole, they have a very sticky tongue, so they'll lurch themselves at something, grab it with their mouth, the tongue, because it's sticky, holds onto the prey, and then they've got to try and swallow it down their throats. So if you've ever watched a frog eating, You'll notice when it blinks, the eyes actually go back into the skull. It's not like ours where the eyelid closes over the eye. The, the frog's eyelid is not stretchy. So when it closes, it actually pushes the eye back into the socket. And what that does is the pressure of blinking, which is why they sometimes blink both eyes together, sometimes one at a time. The pressure of blinking with the eye movement of the eye going back into the skull will help push food down a frog's throat so that it can swallow. Very strange process, but fascinating adaptation, which not many other animals would have. And there are so many wonderful frog species here. Owen and I were actually talking about our favorites, saying, you know, something like a bushveld rain frog, which is out after the rain, something like a banded rubber frog, which is one of my favorites. There's just so many, or a bushveld squeaker. That's one of my favorites as well, called a squeaker because the call sounds a bit like a squeaky toy. Oh, can you hear the bee eaters? I wonder where they are. I can't see them, but I can hear them. I'm hoping they're coming closer. The bee eaters are very big fans of dipping themselves in the water. I'm hoping they come down. I'm gonna spend a few more minutes here just in case those bee eaters do come this way. And just appreciate a bit of the view. Maybe we'll get lucky and have some elephants come down before the rain hits us. But it sounds like Lauren actually has some elephants. So let's head over to her and have a look. We've just been sitting with a lovely herd of Ellie's, but sadly, they've gone in, into the thicket. Now, I am just checking the eastern cut line, but I'm a little bit, ooh, there's something very, very dark coming in. A bit scary looking. But we'll start making our way inwards. I really just wanted to check to see, wow, any signs of Klalamba. The rain was hard, so that's going to have sort of washed away any tracks. It was on the hard terrain, but naturally, oh, there's a bustard. I didn't see you, sorry, dear. But any tracks on the really, really soft sand, you will still be able to pick out. But I feel like I'm driving into a storm. You know, you get those people that chase storms. Storm chasers. That's what I feel like right now. It could just be dark clouds. But we're going to quickly check anyway. <laughs> and then turn. And then once we turn, we won't be able to see it. What you don't know doesn't hurt you.
Elijah, we have many cool insects, especially the flower crab spider. I put one on live last week or maybe the week before. I do feel the insect life is not quite booming as it normally does here, that's for sure. But yes, we get very... We get very cool insects. We get the flower mantis, that's epic, that insect. We get lots of different moths, hawk moths, bees, butterflies, flower crab spiders, although they're technically an arachnid. But yes, we get lots and lots of insects here. The diversity and ab the abundance has been the lowest I've ever seen it. But I'm hoping that maybe with the new rains, everything's just late due to some sort of climatic effect. And I really hope life flourishes. I mean, at this point last year, you were sort of driving like this and just getting insects in your face 24 seven. And that is just not the case. You were driving like a drunk driver, trying to avoid all the dung beetles on the road. And where are they? There are tons of dung balls, elephants everywhere. Where are the dung beetles? I don't know, I don't have the answers, but yes, we get really, really cool insects here. Sorry, I just wanted to check something there. Please don't rain on me. <laughs> I really hope we don't get rained on. But I'm gonna quickly check Pipe Road to see if any signs of Tlalamba cross back over. Wild Earth is offering you a chance to win unique, never-before-seen t-shirts whilst playing an Animal ID game on our new Discord channel. Sign up for free and click on Games to find the Animal ID game. Every time an animal is posted by a mod, you guess the species and in some cases, the individual animal's name. The fastest correct answer will be put into a draw to win a t-shirt that cannot be bought anywhere. Prizes will be awarded every single day. Head over to our Discord channel now and join the Animal ID fun. BirdLife South Africa, our country's only dedicated bird conservation organization. They have been very successful in a number of areas, including the conservation of more than 150,000 hectares of grasslands and estuary habitat, saving thousands of albatrosses in trawl and longline fishing, and training community bird guides as ambassadors for nature in rural areas. Celebrating their official 25th anniversary, they are sharing 25 of their top success stories across their social media platforms. BirdLife South Africa is currently striving towards the conservation of 132 bird species that are heading for extinction. If we conserve birds, we will protect other biodiversity and important habitats that provide clean water and clean air for humans. Their work is forever ongoing. People who love birds can become a member of BirdLife South Africa or make a donation towards a bird conservation project. This is incredible. <laughs> Looks like vivid monkeys do sometimes go for swims. And I heard something splash, but we couldn't see what it was in the long grass. Now I just saw that thing swimming there. This is incredible. I hope it gets to the bank. There are crocodiles in this dam. And it looks like you see that monkey climb up into the tree? Wow. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. My name is David, and I love being a cam op because you get a front row seat to all the best sightings that Wild Earth has to offer. Sharing it with everyone else, well, that's a perk too. What makes the Wild Earth experience magical? Well, it has to be the fact that it's live and interactive. The sighting that'll be ingrained in my brain for life watching a lioness kill three wildebeest during the migration in the space of about 20 minutes. My spirit animal, that has to be a monkey. I wonder if this weaver is still busy building a nest or if it's just overlooking the nests that are already built here at this little pan system. So this is just as we're about to hop onto Gauri Main 
and a very popular little pan system with the weaver's nests overhanging. Oh, there's a green nest, Odie. I've just noticed it. It's so well camouflaged. At the bottom left is a green nest that's still fresh. <clears throat> but there's also a lot of frogs here. You'll find foam nest frogs there. So there's a, a wet one. A lot of foam nest frogs, a lot of weaver's nests overhanging. There you can see the wet one. So the fresh grass as opposed to the dry grass on the right. As it's dried, it's gone brown. And I'm wondering how many of these are actually active. You might find that in a spot like this, all four or five... Oh, there's actually six, six nests. They're just hiding behind the brush. All of those nests are built by one weaver because one male can actually build five or six different nests if he needs to. And you can see there's males and females hopping around in the trees, so I'm wondering if any of them already have eggs in there. I think they're appreciating the fact that the sun is out and it's warming up a little bit before the storm hits. Again, the calm before the storm gets everybody very active. But this pan system we always check, just as we're about to hop onto Gauri Main along Shibamo Track or Shibamo Road, because it's a really deep one that's quite wide. Oh, Rusty, you're moving yourself. And it, um, yeah, there you can see a bit of the greenery. It's a very lush little pan system. So elephants, buffaloes, warthogs, No, the female actually doesn't destroy the nest. If she disapproves, she will simply leave, and often the male might destroy the nest. Otherwise, they'll find that he just abandons the nest and then will go to different ones. So here you can see a bit of the water underneath there. You can see the weaver's nests at the top that are hanging down. Here you can actually see the sky, so you can understand what
Seems like they are up and going. They've started greeting one another, so I don't think it's going to be too long until they start moving. One is always road. I'm approaching at the Pedernati in junction with Seoul. I don't know if you guys can hear, but there's a lot of. It's almost like a squeaky toy, the noise that they make. So this is normally the greeting ceremony that they do before they go up and then start becoming active and moving around. So hopefully this is the beginning. <laughs> All of them greeting one another. There are quite a few of them missing, but at least there's some action. Just guys, don't go behind the Tramad man. Let's just wait. Oh, there you see they're popping out on this side and they might just pop in front of us. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Sounds like some of the youngsters are being reprimanded for whatever reason. Going back there. Oh, there's a lot of dogs coming from a bunch of different directions. Ah, oh, Mr. Madman. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna come in front of us again. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Gotta love the noises that they make. Let me just go forward. I don't know how much this is gonna help, but. to the side so that the cars behind us can have a view. ones in the middle those are all the pups as you can see by size how epic was were all of those sounds <laughs> there was chaos and now they're all chilled
Beverly, yeah, it does. It almost does sound like a little bird trip. It's quite something, isn't it? It's written really epic when they all do it at the same time. It's um, oh, what's happening there? Are you guys still playing around? They got us all excited and then all of a sudden they just, you know, flew by onto the roads and just found this spot here and it's almost like, okay, we ran too quickly. Just got maybe um, um, some brain rush or something like that. Too much blood flowing to, <laughs> to, their, to their heads after that quick, very quick run that they did and now they're obviously exhausted again. <laughs> Oh, it seems like Lauren has managed to find a better view of her cat, so let's head over to see if we can ID who it is. Okay, let's stick our nose in. He's moving again. He is stalking something. Look at that. Look, look, look. It looks like he's gonna pounce. We're back, everyone. Sorry about that. I do apologize. But we're back in the game, and that awful dark looking thing in the sky seems to have skirted around us or have we skirted around it but I'm not sure we're in the clear just yet <laughs> let's wait and see so we are just getting a little bit closer to home just to be safe and then once we're sort of I know, we could spend some time at Gary Dam or even check Gallego quarantine I mean, we definitely got lucky on quarantine this morning, that's for sure. All the hyenas, and even Sutu, I'm so sorry we didn't get to show her to you, we were not live, but Sutu was there. Miss Rowan's Clash, you're welcome. We did have a big spider for you because I just got asked about insects by Elijah. Although spiders are not technically insects, but you can just group them all together as insects and that will work perfectly fine. But we had a banded orbweb spider for you. Huge one, the biggest I've seen yet this season. But sadly, we sort of moved on after we were having a few technical glitches. But I will try to find you other animals. Some days are really quiet out here, Miss Rowan's class, but you know what? The quiet days teach you to appreciate the good days. Imagine if we saw lions, leopards, wild dogs, hyenas, cheetah, every single day. You would start to just think that was normal and you would really take it for granted. It's not normal to see them every day. This is their wild habitat. It's not a zoo, it's not captivity. We are just really, really lucky to be driving in it. Let me just double check the weather. That's gonna make my decision. How we looking, how we looking? Okay, I think I'm gonna take this road today and it's maybe looking okay. But we are going to send you over to Tessa with a nest. We are still sitting appreciating our weaver's nests <clears throat> and we've actually been watching there's been a male and the odd female that has been joining him and they've been coming down to the nest and they're actually still busy. The male is still busy constructing the green nest. 
So the view that we have, he's been bouncing up and down. You can see there's still quite a few gaps in that nest. So he started and he's coming down to the bottom of the basket at the moment. So you can see the gaps through the back where he hasn't quite finished it up on the side yet before he moves around. <coughs> Petunia, the reason that the weavers have the opening at the bottom there, you can see them hang, hanging upside down at the entrance, is because it makes it more difficult for predators to get into the nest. So they have a basket hanging down off of a very thin branch, which means something heavy like a snake would not be able to get to the branch because the, the weight would be too much and the branch would drop and the snake would hopefully fall. But if it does get there, it does make it more difficult for anything else to access the nest. So that's where the entrance is, where it was hanging. And then you'll see there's a slightly different section. It almost looks like an upside down heart. So there's an entrance and then it goes up and into the chamber, which is the rounded section. And so the, the eggs will be slightly lower than the entrance, but you've got to come in from the bottom to make it more difficult for predators to get access to the eggs and the chicks. So it's a very good defense strategy to build a nest like this. And most of the weavers will build nests like this. Village weavers, southern masked weavers, although theirs is a bit more messy. They will all build nests that are hanging baskets. <laughs> There's a little glimpse of a woodland kingfisher which has been dipping itself in the water every now and then and now it seems to be shaking itself off after a bath. But it's very well hidden in this buffalo thorn. What you will actually notice as well is have a look at the foliage on the right that you can see lots of leaves and then a bare branch on the left. Now if you'll notice, all of the weaver's nests are on the bare part of the buffalo we oh, sorry, of the buffalo thorn. And so they've actually used, they can use those leaves, so they can actually use them for lining the nest, but at the same time, you might find different species will actually feed on those leaves. And what this does is it allows them to have a better view of what is coming on the branches in case it's coming towards the nests. So if it is a snake, you'll struggle to see it on the branches that have a lot of leaves. But these, you can imagine, if it is slithering along a branch, it gives the weavers the advantage of being able to see it and they might be able to mob it or something like that to try and get rid of the snake before it gets to the nest. But it is fascinating to watch them coming in and out of this little area. Miss Rowan's class, to protect the eggs from falling out, you'll see that one section of the nest, the right-hand side, is lowered down. And then there's a bit of a, an indent at the bottom and then another basket shape to the left, so the upside-down heart shape. What happens is, inside of the nest, there's actually a little ridge. And so with the angle of the nest, you would come in through the chamber, have to go up and then back down to the eggs so that the eggs are lower down in the entrance, but there's a bit of a, a raised section in the nest to stop the eggs in this wind and the breeze. You can imagine they might move around a bit. It stops them from being able to get to the entrance. So it's actually structured so that the basket is lower down in the entrance, and there's a bit of a ridge to protect it. A very good view is that one that's actually facing us, Owen, at the top. You can see the chamber going in, but you can see the bottom part is lower and that bottom part behind, that's where the eggs would be so that they can't roll up and over the entrance. Very, very well designed and very intricately weaved so there's no gaps in the nest, the wind can't get in too much, it's sheltered, it's safe and even insects and things might struggle to break through the outside. Oh, the bubbling casinos just got so loud. But this has been a very productive little pan system this afternoon. We've seen a lot of different birds. A 
Rosemary, I agree. The way that they swaying in the wind, it's an intricate basket and it just looks so nice and gentle the way it's swaying. Oh, there's actually this bottom one, Owen. There's a weaver popping its head out of the bottom. I've just noticed the beak coming out. There's the head. There you can see the head coming out. <laughs> so they're obviously very used to being moved around while they're in the nest. They definitely don't get motion sickness, I wouldn't think. With such a flimsy branch to build your nest on, you've got to expect that it's going to be moving a lot. <laughs> I wonder if it's contemplating coming out. Maybe that's why it's looking around. Possibly looking for some food. So you might find <clears throat> that all of these nests are from the one male because we have only seen one male here. He's busy building the one. The others are nicely formed already and have females in them. And this is really normal for weaver species. They are what we call polygynous, which means one male can attract multiple females. And the average for weavers is anywhere between one and five females for one male. So you can imagine he uses a lot of energy to build these nests because he has to build one for each female and she has to approve of it. So he's busy building this one at the moment. He'll try and attract a female and if she says this nest is not good enough, he'll either destroy it or he'll actually just start a whole new one again. So they can build multiple nests throughout this breeding season just to try and keep the females happy because being such a precarious position to have a nest, you can imagine it needs to be strong enough to withstand the weather, so rain, wind, predators as well. He has to choose a spot, which is why it's very close to the end of the branches and not in the middle. And it has to be formed enough that the eggs won't roll out. He's actually sitting right at the top of the tree on the other side at the moment. There you can see him. Beautiful yellow color in the light. Yes, definitely the male. So the female doesn't have the black mask over the face and they're not as brightly colored. This bright coloration helps to attract the females. So he has to look handsome, but he has to be a good builder as well. Oh, that was a beautiful call. There's another one calling back. actually chatting to each other there's one in front of us somewhere in the brush ah he's gone towards it <laughs> okay we are going to leave our little pan system and see if we can find anything coming along the boundary before the rain hits with the launch of wild earth's genesis collection of non-fungible tokens this week we thought it would be a great time to take a trip down memory lane. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you can join Lauren and Tess at the fire for a special look back at some of the animals in the first collection. From seeing Tandy save her babies from the baboons, to the first time we spotted Kongile. There's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Guys, guys, Karula has brought her cubs to Juma. We've been tracking her. Isn't this amazing? It promises to be a real tearjerker. Wild Earth is launching this NFT collection and others in the future to find an alternative way to fund conservation. Join us straight after the Sunset Safari on Saturday the 29th of January for an unforgettable fireside chat. It has been a wonderful privilege to identify one of our key characters here at Penguin Beach, Peppa, with a very, very distinct facial patterning, as the name would suggest, very peppered and speckled belly. I'm really looking forward to seeing what this penguin does over the next few days and months. Because of those unique markings, it's going to be really, really cool to watch it as it moves around the penguin colony here at Stony Point. <laughs> oh, 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 what 
are you doing? Are you trying out for the ballet? <laughs> now it's an itchy bottom. Up we get. Mom's coming. Everybody's moving off. Hi, I'm Mike Anderson, and I come to you live every day from Eco Training Pridelands Conservancy in South Africa. The wild animal I think is most underrated, I think buffaloes are the most underrated. They're so, t so tenacious and ferocious and also very, very protective of each other, which I find incredible. You know, sometimes people think of the big five, they just think of lions and leopards and other big animals. But I think buffaloes are pretty underrated. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Excuse me, everyone. I'm not getting a chance to put my cover on. It's raining. Okay. I don't know how much use that will be, but we shall try. Okay, we're going to get a little bit closer to home. It's getting heavier. I'm just trying at least shelter from the rain for now. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to pull any covers down at the back or are we all good? We're good for now, okay. The presenter always ends up really unlucky in this vehicle. There's no salvage in the presenter, I'm afraid. The cameramen have it quite sweet in the back there. Yep. <laughs> they just box themselves in and they're all nice and dry. This is getting very heavy at our side. I'm not sure about Tessa. But we may have to, if it gets any heavier, we probably are going to head back to camp. But I believe Tessa is tracking. Just what you leave on the thing. Okay, so we have definitely got a lot of very different things that we are seeing today and it's because the ground is wet and so it's a lot more noticeable. But have a look how an elephant or a herd of elephants has moved through and disturbed the wet soil. But what actually caught my eye is have a look at this pile of dung. This is most likely from one elephant. And so far, I'm not kidding when I say I have counted over 100 marula fruits in the dung. So this has been picked apart by something else to look for fruits. And it's literally over 100 marula fruits that I've counted so far and I did not get to the balls further left. It is absolutely ridiculous. So this shows you how little an elephant processes its food. This is why they have to eat so many marula fruits because most of them come out whole. I mean, literally, you can actually still see some further to the right that are still green. They haven't been processed at all. And it's just this massive pile of marula fruits mixed in between all of this dung. So something has come along and started picking apart the dung, maybe something like a hornbill or a squirrel or a mongoose. There you can see those balls are still intact. And inside of those balls of dung, you can see marula fruits popping out. You can also see quite a few flies and other insects that are on top of the dung. But how ridiculous to think that if each elephant in just one pile of dung has over 100 marula fruits coming out, you can imagine why marula trees take a massive knock at this time of the year. This is one elephant and one pile of dung, over 100 fruits. I literally counted them.
I counted every one on the right hand side. <laughs> JV, exactly. This is why elephants are always, always eating. I think this is the most whole marula fruit I've ever seen in one pile of dung. And it doesn't look like it was one elephant. It looks like it might have been a breeding herd because there's piles of dung all over and a lot of disturbed ground. So this wouldn't have even necessarily been a male. This might have been a young male. It might have been a female. And yet there are that many marula fruits. So they are very nice and sweet. I can attest to that. I do love a marula fruit. I know Lauren always has them in her car to snack on. But they really are. It's an excessive amount of marula fruit. It, re it, it just it caught my eye straight away. I actually reversed to come back and count them after I noticed it. <laughs> Absolutely crazy. Goodness gracious, now you can imagine so many other animals will now have access to these marula fruits, which they might not have had before. And being slightly processed, you might find the skin is a bit softer, so other animals would be able to get to the fruits and nuts a bit easier once it's been through an elephant's digestive system. Sounds a bit strange, but there's actually certain brands of coffee, there's certain brands of um, a variety of things that are more expensive because they have been through certain animals. <laughs> Lots of different uses for things, everybody. Okay, I just wanted to show you that. I just thought it was rather mind-blowing, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> to have that many marula fruits in a pile of dung. Oh my word. Some of that was just a clump, a handful of just marula fruits where the rest of the debris has been picked apart from the, the dung. starting to rain quite hard over here. Quite hard. Let me put my cover back on for my screen. Goodness gracious. Just at the right time we started moving. Waterproof get up. Okay, so now I'm back on my mission. I got slightly distracted, but I think for a good reason. Testing my my counting skills at the same time. Okay, we are starting to get quite wet and it sounds like Lauren has got a hippo, which I can imagine is very wet at the moment. So let's head over to her. We are positioned under a tree right now, but it is getting heavier and heavier on our side. I'm just going to let you listen to the little pitter-patter right now as we watch the hippo. rainy days. I love diving in the rainy days the most because underwater you're, you're not affected by it at all. And the fish all behave slightly differently. They all, the rain disturbs the surface of the water so all the fish come to the surface to see what the disturbance is, hoping that it's food. But of course it's not food, it's a pitter-patter of the water droplets. I'm sure it is thoroughly enjoying the rain. What's a few more droplets when you're already wet? They are amphibious, really, if you think about it. Amphibious ungulates.
everyone. That is thunder, I'm afraid. Rain's getting heavier. Little squirrel is out, though. Okay, everyone, you know that thunder's a bit of a no-no for us. I'm af oh, it's Tap King attacking the monitor lizard. <gasps> Let's just watch this play out before. <gasps> She's trying to protect her babies. Oh, the saga just continues. But I'm afraid thunder's a bit of a no-no for us, everyone. So maybe it'll clear up. But for now, we are going to head into a repeat. Have you ever seen a hippo's tongue? <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought. Play. Yes, I know it was play, but I'd, I had a point and I forgot it. I got distracted. I just, I find young hippos so funny. I can see you guys. Yeah, and it's through things like play fighting, for example, for young males and so on. When they, when the, when they play fight, they build up their abilities and how to do that. And all young animals will do it. I mean, you'll see lions doing it. You'll see uh, leopard cubs climbing up trees. You'll see um, young elephants play fighting or putting up their trunks against one another and trying to push each other out of the way. So there, there's value in what they're doing, even if to us it doesn't seem like something particularly important and it's just funny to watch them. They are building the skills that will hopefully help ensure their survival at later on. Um, Kevin, you were wondering if the hippos give birth in the water. They do, they give birth in the water, they mate in the water, and they can also nurse their young ones underwater. So they are very well adapted to the semi-aquatic lifestyle, and I say semi-aquatic because they'll spend most of their time in the water, it's the area where they feel safe, but they come out of the water at night to look for food. So they actually need also the land. The ones at the back are playing. This one's the, on the right. Like big hippos, they're play fighting now. Although there's quite a size difference. <laughs> I want to say these are probably two young boys. No offense to the young boys out there, but I don't think <laughs> the females will try to fight that way. Getting serious now. <laughs> Starting to get a little bit more active, the hippos, now that the sun's going down. Unary males in general of all the species tend to live slightly less than females, so so generally hippos are believed to live until they're about 30 to 35, so the females will probably live a little bit longer, more towards 35 and upwards, and the males more towards 30. The reason for it is the males engage in a lot more fighting and a lot of more defending of territories than the females, the females in general tend to just do their own thing and they don't spend as much time fighting other creatures of the same species. So the males tend to live slightly less than the females. Same in the case of the hippos. A dominant bull will try to hold on to the, his power and the um, his territory or his pod for as long as possible without allowing or fight or while fighting off any other potential suitors that might try to take over his pod. The little one going out. Oh, you had a spool. I thought that you were gonna go out. 
We just want to see your tiny little legs. That is it. Well, for such a young creature, it's very agile in the water and clearly feels comfortable jumping up and down there. Shame, she's looking up like, oh, please help me. <laughs> it's quite a handful, this youngster. Samantha, I think that hippos um, are fully grown, maybe when they're about six to eight years old, depending if it's a male or a female. So it takes, so they'll, they'll be sexually mature before then and they won't be under the care of the mother at that age, but it takes them quite a while to become adults. So this little one still has got a very long life ahead of it and a very long time before we can actually call it a, a fully grown hippo either a male or a female. Okay. I thought it tried getting in t on top of the mom's back. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it can't reach. It's jumping or bouncing off the bottom and then just trying to get on top of the mom, but it can't. <laughs> a new angle. <laughs> I think it's definitely trying to convince the mom of something. Something naughty. <laughs> Maybe it just wants to go on its mom's shoulders and the mother won't let it. Look, it's definitely trying. It really wants to go on top of the mom's back. <laughs> and the mom's having none of it. Oh, it did it. It did it for a second. <laughs> Where did you guys disappear onto? just playing games, just jumping from on top of the mother from one side to the next. <laughs> it's actually very adorable. Yes! You did it! Yay! At long last! I wonder why it's keeping the nose in, in the... Oh! Oh! The mom's just like, no, I said no, I will not carry you. <gasps> but why? <laughs> Let's see if she stands back up just to make it slip down again. I think she's been carrying it the whole day and she just doesn't feel like it anymore. <laughs> Are you gonna try again? Maybe it needs to come running. Two youngsters at the back are back at it, like fully grown hippos with big tusks. to choose where to watch because as the ones are fighting in the back then the little one is just like almost like doing hoops and loops to get some top of the mother <laughs> that's very funny I 
looked like a dolphin there, just trying to stick its head out of the water. It's almost like they've got the zoomies now. They were going into the crazy hour, you know, that, that I don't know if parents call it suicide hour, but it's that hour before, you know, when they get hyperactive just before they have to have dinner or go to sleep or something like that, and then they just go a little bit crazy. They start running around and doing all sorts of things. What a handful. Flipper. flipper. Yeah, maybe we should call it flipper, Darren. You're right. <sighs> Why are you yawning, ma'am? Hey, Evelyn, you say you want to eat whatever this hippo has. Well, whatever it is, it will certainly make you hyper. <laughs> I thought for a second there when she opened its mouth that it was maybe going to try and jump on her mouth. That would have been quite funny, to be honest. <laughs> it must also be very slippery to try and get on top of the mother, because they are also slippery themselves. And with all that water, I don't think it's the... it's not attempting to do the easiest of things. We call a group of hippos a pod or a raft. Oh, I think mom's decided she they're going, they're going. I wonder if she's gonna come into the island. Kind of nudging it in that direction. It's shallower there as you can see, because you can see more of the hippo. Another little one, but I'm not sure what her plans are right now. Maybe she's just like, fine, we'll play around here for a little bit. You're being a handful. Or maybe this is a timeout area. I'm not sure yet. Peaceful surroundings, the nature. It's not something I can get in my homeland. So it's wonderful to be able to be live, you know, with, with you guys and feel like you're actually there. If you want to go on safari with a wild earth guide whilst honing your bush knowledge and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. With wild dogs, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. We don't always get to see those, so that's, that's just been amazing. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. I wanted to be part of the support of Wild Earth. It brings so much um, to everybody and everything has brought so much to me, especially, you know, it got me through some difficult times myself. I found Wild Earth shortly before I was going to go through some things in my, my own personal life, and it's what got me through, and I know that's a story for many, many, many people, so it's important to me to provide support to that. Wildlife trafficking remains a growing problem in South Africa and often made worse by the way the media portray this complex issue. WESA, the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, in partnership with WWF South Africa and supported by USAID, have recently embarked on a program whereby they train reporters to better tell stories of wildlife trafficking. In my community, Wildlife conservation is mostly something other people do, and I would like to change that. My name is Iman Singhi. I told people I met that the pangolin is one of the most trafficked animals on the planet. But what is a pangolin, they said. Why is it in danger? This is what made me decide that the pangolin story must be told. If we are to play a part in preventing the extinction of this animal, then we must all be part of the battle. A partnership between WWF South Africa and WESA, supported by USAID. There is clearly 
something in the vicinity around you that's drawn their attention. Yes, that meerkat in the tree is just the coolest of cool meerkat. But watch out how, how he battles when he comes down. <laughs> that would be like me climbing a tree, just better. So much action here, everyone. How much? How long has it been since Ribbon initially took the matriarch role? Ribbon took over in 2019, November. So, two years. Or was it 2020? It was 19. So she's been the matriarch for two years, guys. Something is really going on. Now, Gingarika's come right next to the car. She almost ran to the car to lie here. Look at this scratching her head it's almost as if she feels a little bit of comfort in the car and i can't explain what's happening here corky's up to no good they've all got blood on their face all of them even in tima sorry Owen, i'm putting let's just look at in tima's ears here because i don't think it's blood from a kill they've either all had some sort of altercation with other hyenas or there's a massive internal dispute going on and when i saw them yesterday i didn't want to think that I didn't want to think there was anything going on, but Intima is not acting like Intima, everybody. We have just been sitting here watching Corks dominate Intima. How can that be? Oh, Corks, you're not looking so bonny. You're not a bonny wee lass anymore. Oh, okay, this is gonna be interesting. Let's watch. Corky's acting very dominant, guys. That tail has barely been down. And Angela, I'm really not sure. I'm, I don't want to speculate at this stage, but I do feel some something has happened. Yesterday, I thought it was an internal dispute over possibly food. I mean, they were all just sleeping at Twin Dams, but no, 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 this behavior. I don't quite know what to think. And Tima's got blood, Corky's got blood, Hart's also got blood, and Hart doesn't seem to be bothering about anything, really. She's just gone to sleep next to Gingi. But and Tima's the one that I had, what is going on, girl? She looks skinny. I think she may have lost in Tambu, everyone. But we don't know that yet, we don't know that. I'm really quite shocked by this sighting, everyone. I, I think Julie is as well. I really can't believe what is actually going on. This is all stemming from Corky. Corks, are you causing trouble, girl? I was there for the matriarchal takeover. It happened in camp. Did you know that, Julie? Yeah, I did not. It happened meters from my bedroom, and we were all in bed. I've never seen so many colleagues of mine in their pajamas and their underpants run out because <laughs> it sounded like someone was being murdered. And it was the most 
it was the most horrible, horrible night in camp. Oh, and were you there? Yeah. You were there. Everyone came down. James Henry's in his underpants. Everyone's in their pajamas. Jamie Patterson in her pajamas. And we really thought that someone was being murdered. Yeah. And no one died that night. No hyena went missing that night, should I say. So it wasn't a case of someone being, it was noises like that, but screaming, lots of blood, so many hyenas running around camp in the dark, we couldn't see. It was intense. She's coming. Tell me what's going on. I mean, these injuries on the face, they'll heal. Our elbow's not looking great, but Corks has had an injury on her elbow, I think, that keeps opening up, but it's in Tima, and Tima's acting very, very submissive. Sure. I would like to think not, but naturally there was, I believe, a situation at Pride Lens, and it all depends on the situation. It all depends on people's behavior and how they are actually, not people's, <laughs> individual's behavior and how they are acting to whatever is going on. It also depends on what happens to Ribbon. I'm not saying anything has happened to Ribbon, everyone. I really don't want to speculate. I want to go back on this footage and really really thick you know if you slow mo it slow mo <laughs> you can really look at who's dominant at that moment i mean i think it's clear that corky is dominating dominating in Tima for some reason so my question now is ribbon we've seen june june is chill june's been sunbathing and going to the spa every single day so what's happened with ribbon i haven't seen her in a few days and for her cubs at this stage momo i don't know but I've not seen Corky act like this since 2018, 2019. I love Corks and she's had it tough. And this is the anniversary, just I think two days ago, of Dark Mane attacking her. Three years. She's not had it easy. She's an absolute survivor. And the thing with the hyenas, I love them all. Ribbon and Tima, Hart, June, Corks, love them all. I couldn't possibly ever sort of choose between them, but they've got to settle their disputes, I guess. And something is going on. I've never seen in TMAC this submissive in a while. Her mum's a matriarch, after all. Corky just won't settle. Heart's gone to sleep. Gingy's gone to sleep. And Tima's also resting. But Corky just, oh, okay, okay. Now we're going to settle. So she's chosen to settle over here, Odie, next to Heart and Gingy. And that's interesting. And Tima's on her own. But they're still together, if that makes sense. So if a pride of lions were to come, they, they would form a unit together. They're a, they're a clan. They would, you know fight off the lions together, but between these individuals, you've got a close relationship here between Hart and Corky forming, or has already been formed, and Gingy's obviously going to be with her mum, and then you've got Antima on her own here that screams every time Corky comes near. Everyone's got blood, and it doesn't look like blood from a kill. Oh, I can't wait to hear what you all think of this, especially you, Michael Fleetwood, and you, Chris Rogue. Can't wait to hear your interpretations. But I think at this stage, let's not try to speculate too much. Let's try to observe. I've been seeing June a lot with Sutu and Novella. So what is going on with Ribbon? 
Victor, very intense. Actually, the, the vocalizations from Antima were slightly horrifying. They were. It made me feel uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Very, she was scared. She was scared. Yes. And this is this is the thing we always get asked: Would a hyena kill another hyena? They are the the clan, but they've got to establish their. They've got to sort it out between themselves. And Corky here, she's not she's not hurting Intima, but she's acting dominant over Intima, and Intima's bowing down at this stage. If Intima was to challenge her, then a fight may happen and it could get really aggressive it could sort of result in death but we get asked this question a lot and i think it's quite fascinating that as long as everyone just adheres to what's going on stick to their rank but corks you're looking um you're looking haggard is what we would say in scotland <laughs> i don't know if that is a word used elsewhere but we would say haggard And isn't it amazing? I brought my Juma clan family tree with me today. I've been forgetting it. And they're just lying on Gary Main. I mean, we're on Gary Main right now, which is obviously not ideal in terms of traffic. Vehicles are going to come by, you guys. I know many of you love hyenas. I do speak to Chris and Michael a lot about hyenas, but I know many of you love them. And I think at this stage, we'll just have to... Uh. But we did watch... Ribbon assert herself over June the other day at the den. I think that was a handful of days ago. Uh, Ribbon was in the dangerance, the huge, and... <laughs> June came. There seems to be a nice bond between them right now, Ribbon and June, and June stood over her to initiate a greeting ceremony, ceremony but Ribbon 100% asserted herself over June, and that was just a handful of days ago. Hearts just chilled. <laughs> I wonder what's going on. I wonder what's happening at the ribbons at the chain. And oh. But please don't worry, everyone. We will figure it out. It sometimes takes time, and we will get to the bottom of it. It takes a lot of observations, and that's why sometimes you just have to sit. You just have to watch. Otherwise. Look at that, it's amazing. Wow, hey. And five. Four, three, two, one, live, live. Oh, that's cool. Just in there. And the black mob is going up the tree and the mongoose is attacking it. It's gonna pounce again. <laughs> I'm sure you can all agree with me. It's not a bad start to our Wednesday morning. Something that I have never seen before in my entire life that you are now watching live. Look at that. It's just beautiful. Fantastic display by a little herd of springbuck. How is this view? My heart is in my mouth, everybody. Amazing, they've locked their tusks together. You can hear the cracking crunches. <laughs> It is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin and it's completely unfazed by my presence whatsoever. 
How insane is that animal? Amazing. Fantastic to watch. Well, now we've got a tug of war between mom and daughter. Look. I'm just at a loss for words. Yeah. I mean, that's just incredible to see that. Look at that tail. She's definitely fascinated. She's intrigued by something here. Oh, now we've got more vultures. She's definitely listening to whatever's happening in the drainage line. I think with the amount of hyena activity we've had, maybe she managed to kill something in the drainage line. The hyenas managed to steal it. And now we are able to sit here and watch her as she's analyzing what's happening. Just a reminder, everybody, this beautiful girl, Tlalamba, is part of the Genesis collection. So if you want to find out more, you can head over to the Wild Earth website and look for the NFTs tab. I think she is the prettiest. Not quite as pretty as Kachala, maybe, but so beautiful. I feel like Tlalamba has a different type of beauty around her. She's such a big female. And she's the perfect combination of muscle and grace. Isn't she lovely? Oh, you can see that white tail from here. She is looking for everything and anything this morning and she is being distracted by all of the noises. And this is actually a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's, um, for a leopard, it's it's part of the reason why they are so successful because they pay so much attention to the smaller details, all the small movements, all the small noises, the smells. All of the predators will do it, but leopards in particular, because they're on their own, <clears throat> they know they can't rely on anyone else. And so from a very young age, they get used to listening to absolutely everything around them. And so it's lovely to see her being so attentive and so careful about what she's listening to. She's pausing very regularly. And you can hear there's a bird alarm calling at her, so that got her tail going, and straight away, look at that change in behavior. The tail is up instead of down because of the alarm calling. So she's saying, all right, I know you've seen me. I'm moving, I'm not staying here, I'm not hunting. And this is giving animals the opportunity to see her approaching so that she can avoid any situation where she might accidentally get injured. You definitely don't want to be mobbed by a herd of elephants or something. So if there's alarm calling and she can raise her tail, everything can see her from a distance and there's no need to accidentally surprise someone. That being said, I think if she surprised a scrub here right now, she'd probably go for it. She does look like she's eaten a little bit. Her stomach is not flat but it is more difficult to tell because of the way her mammary glands are hanging. Her stomach hangs a bit lower naturally now from the cubs. But she definitely could eat again, I think. That bird is still alarm calling behind us. It's one of the cysticulars. Now you can see she's dropped her tail again, so this is conveying I'm far enough away from the alarm call. Oh, Nikonova, that would be wonderful. She's going to send Mark. It would be wonderful to meet Kuchava's cub. Oh, she didn't send Mark. Wow. Throwing me under the bus there. <laughs> um, yes, it would be so lovely to meet Kuchava's cub before I go. I'm very happy that I've gotten to meet Columbus Cubs at least. I'd love to see them again, but I think any chance you get to meet a new leopard and spend some time with it, not much compares in this world to that feeling. Because it really is an honor to be able to spend time with a leopard like this. 
you know, leopards are very secretive, they're very, very quiet in their movements, and so if they don't want to be seen like the last few days, they won't be. They absolutely will not be seen if they don't want to be. So for her to be out in the open, allowing us to follow, is just, it's an absolute gift. This makes every day worth it. So the direction she is moving in, she if she heads up to the right, she will still end up back at quarantine. If she goes left, she'll end up in the drainage line that's fed by Voyotella Dam. So it'll be interesting to see where she decides to go. If she keeps going straight down on this road, she's going to end up near Ribbon's Den site at Twin Dams. Don't know if she'll go that far though. I love it when she sits and listens, that's when she's really intent, she's focused. She's listening back up towards quarantine again. So remember where we are. She wants to make sure there's nothing coming up from the drainage line, but also no disturbing sounds coming from quarantine because the surrounding drainage lines around quarantine is where we think the cubs are still hidden. We haven't seen tracks of the cubs anywhere other than going into the one drainage line. We haven't seen them coming out, but Rex and found Lalamba's tracks on her own this morning, which means she's hidden the cubs somewhere. And with all the hyenas around, I think her kill was stolen, so she needs to find some more food. And that's probably why she's out on her own. And taking the chance, even though she's in the open like this, for any leopard, taking the chance to sit and listen is a really good combination of things. It's giving her information on who's around. It's also giving her information on potential hunting sites, potential prey around the area, and potential threats. So she's doing a combination of everything. She's the ultimate multitasker right now because she's even grooming while she's listening. She's also gonna be smelling while she's grooming. So she can pick up on all of these different things. Incredible senses, very, very heightened senses. Yeah, she keeps looking over towards the drainage line in particular. I think her kill must have been in there somewhere. me she's always had such bold geometric rosettes compared to the other leopards yes they all have rosettes but hers just seem to be very bold in terms of they're very thick very close together looks like she's been designed by a perfect architect she's thinking at the moment she's definitely hearing something that we can't maybe some movement in the drainage line if the hyenas have finished the carcass and they're moving up and down she might be hearing that movement can you get any more beautiful We are also very happy to see her and I'm glad that it has brought you joy seeing her this morning. It is always such a treat when you've been tracking her and you know she's in the area and you've been tracking for a few days and then you get to see her and it just kind of reaffirms what you know about the bush but also it reaffirms the condition she's in and we get to have a little bit of a bonding moment with her and, and see what is happening in her life. It's a nice little window into the life of a leopard. Let's see if I can move. She's actually headed towards the drainage line. 
unexpected twist. I was expecting her to go more towards quarantine. But I can see why she would choose this. There's a nice termite mount and some dead trees. And so I'm gonna see if I can follow her towards the drainage line and see what we can find in there with her. Miss Lalamba is now headed straight down towards the drainage line. She's paused again to have a listen. And her tail keeps moving ever so slightly right on the tip. And I think she might be assessing whether it's safe to go into the drainage line, but at the same time, whether there's any potential food down here. As you can see, she's using this long grass to her advantage and just giving it a little evaluation while she's here. So the only thing I've seen so far moving on the other side of her has been a Swainson spoofowl. Oh, she must have a fly bothering her. I haven't seen anything else, but this is a perfect area for Dyker. Morgan and Frankie, you are 11 and 7. Thank you so, so much for your question. Tlalamba's cubs are just about three months old now, we think, about 12 weeks. So they are still very young and very cute and very small. And we don't know yet who they will grow up to be, but we can already see some nice personality traits coming through. And hopefully, well, it seems like one is like mom and one is like dad, actually. One cub seems to be a bit more like Chalamba, a bit adventurous, outgoing. The other one, maybe a little bit more like Mulwati, a little bit more shy. So it seems like a pretty good split of leopard personalities at this stage. But I hope we can find them for you sometime soon in the next few days. And I feel like we have definitely got very lucky this morning to have ended with such a gorgeous girl. I'd love to know where she's going from here. Maybe there's a dyker she can hear somewhere. Oh my goodness, how perfect is she? Look at those ears in the grass. Everyone, I am so happy that you could join us this morning. <laughs> that we could share Salamba with you and all of the little odds and ends, the Shongo Lolos and the birds. It's been an absolutely wonderful morning and hopefully we'll be able to find her around here again this afternoon. At least we know where to start now. And we're definitely looking forward to having you with us for our safari this afternoon. Hopefully we can end with some more spots like we did this morning. How exciting perfect way to end our morning with you. Thanks everyone. Wild Earth is offering you a chance to win unique, never-before-seen t-shirts whilst playing an Animal ID game on our new Discord channel. Sign up for free and click on Games to find the Animal ID game. Every time an animal is posted by a mod, you guess the species and in some cases, the individual animal's name. The fastest correct answer will be put into a draw to win a t-shirt that cannot be bought anywhere. Prizes will be awarded every single day. Head over to our Discord channel now and join the Animal ID Fun. There we go, look, all three in one frame. <laughs> look at that, isn't that cool? Oh, that is so special. That is exactly what we had been hoping for, is all three of them to come together and make the perfect little family portrait. I am an outdoor photographer, a wildlife filmmaker, and a conservation storyteller. 
Penguin Beach is going to offer us this really unique opportunity to watch and pick up on the smallest of details in the penguins' lives. It's going to allow us the time to really get to know these penguins well, get to know their story, and get to interpret the little finer details and share that with you with a live TV show and get you to fall in love with penguins. The bushwalk feed allows the camera person some creative license. This is my favorite style of shooting. You have to be mentally and physically prepared. You're shooting handheld in some very strange and contorted positions, always with a straight back, often in the squat position low to the ground. The creativity comes down to the relationship and sync you have with your presenter. The more you understand each other, the more you'll be able to tell the story seamlessly. We have literally just bumped into some Ellie's tearing apart the tree. But this is actually a good thing. The hyenas are somewhere here. So maybe between all of us we can listen, we can hear the Ellie. But if we can pick up on some poops or contact calls, that's going to be such a winner for us right now. I'm not off-roading off after highly mobile hyenas in the dark. The little ones. Oh. On. Elephants can get irritated by lights. Have any lights on? This is solely infrared. Listen and just enjoy this. Elephants on a hot summer's night.
push that over right in front of our tree. Right in front of our car, sorry. It's fine. It's fine. Hey, girl. I'm so happy to see you right now. Yes, I am. I'm still going to stay silent, everyone, and just let you listen to this incredible sighting.
still here, everyone. I just think you don't need to hear my voice right now. This is just something that you can all enjoy. of Wild Earth's Genesis collection of non-fungible tokens this week, we thought it would be a great time to take a trip down memory lane. Sign up to be a Wild Earth explorer and you can join Lauren and Tess at the fire for a special look back at some of the animals in the first collection. From seeing Tandy save her babies from the baboons, to the first time we spotted Kongile. There's a tiny, tiny leopard cub. Karula has given birth overnight. Guys, guys, Karula has brought her cubs to Juma. We've been tracking her. Isn't this amazing? It promises to be a real tearjerker. Wild Earth is launching this NFT collection and others in the future to find an alternative way to fund conservation. Join us straight after the Sunset Safari on Saturday the 29th of January for an unforgettable fireside chat. Cape Nature is the chief custodian of the Western Cape of South Africa's natural environment. This highly successful organization strives to conserve the province's natural heritage to ensure a sustainable future. Besides nurturing nature, Cape Nature offers an authentic ecotourism experience to local and international visitors. And one of these experiences is walking amongst the penguins at Stony Point, or as we know it, Penguin Beach. Wild Earth broadcasts live from here every day and is very privileged to be partnered with Cape Nature who have focused their conservation efforts here. If you want to visit these iconic black and white African penguins for yourself, then head over to our website to find out more. Cape Nature. Conserve. Explore. Experience. Guys, just watch what's happening. See, watch the elephant, watch the lions. See, the first ones to run are the cubs. They are right here. I'm not sure how scared you were, but I was quite nervous. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. The best find of today. Mm hmm. Is you? Doesn't look rather comfortable, but we see you. Isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> Are you just sunbathing, chilling, living the chill life? <laughs> this is obviously a rock monitor. We definitely see the water monitors or the Nile monitors a lot more than we see the rock. But you can see this is where they hide. And little holes and crevices and trees. And then they just pop themselves out to sunbathe. Hmm, you look very relaxed up there. I'm rather jealous. So, so stunning. <laughs> 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 
Now, they are actually incredible swimmers of rocks. They're just not as... Sorry, we've had, this is a beautiful shot of the Ellie. We're also surrounded by Ellie's. I don't know. Oh, this is also magical. I don't know what to talk about. These are the Ellie's that popped up from the drainage. I thought I would be able to get them. Hello. Mm. Buffalo thorn, delish. The thorns and the hooks clearly don't put you off. <laughs> the leaves are very nutritious. Even for humans, sometimes I snack on them in camp when I'm walking by. <laughs> yeah, I can see why you like them. I tried to fry them up one time. There's a delicacy in the Maldives called telefi, and they use leaves of a specific tree, very small leaves, and they dry them out in the sun, then they fry them in garlic, uh, lemon, and salt and oil, and mm, they're the best things in the world. I introduced Davi to them, and ah. Okay, someone's taking a tantrum. Anyway, I thought maybe I could do the same with buffalo thorn. But it didn't work. <laughs> Everybody around the table, James Henry pretended to like them, but no, I know they were lying. Might get a two shot here, OD. If the Ellie doesn't scare away our little lizard. There you go, there's a lizard. <laughs> I've got the two of them together. It's coming very close to the car now to get the vegetation. Here, Owen. You see the youngsters? Hazel, so you're saying you love how chilled that rock monitor is. I know. <laughs> Probably not got enough energy to do anything else, but so chilled. Hello, guys. Are you gonna go to Gary Dam for a drink? I really think you should. You know, these elephants actually might scare away the monitor. They're right underneath them now. <laughs> What a cool sighting. a bit dramatic. Very dramatic. Mm -hmm. No, not a 
at all, Susan. Not at all. We have no need to. It's not a it's not anything that elephants need to pay attention to. Oh and twelve o'clock. Hello. I've got an itchy leg. Beautiful girl. I can see you having a sniff of us. Mm-hmm. You're not very subtle, but that's okay. I hope I don't smell bad. But Susan, not at all. He's watching them. But they don't have to bother with his presence at all. They're, poor. They're all coming here. There's obviously some delicious grass. <laughs> Underneath this quarry. <laughs> Are you smelling us and you think that we can't see you because we can? Look at those nostrils, that's incredible. They're huge. Okay, that was just a chance to come and smell us. It was fake, pretending I'm going to eat. <laughs> I'm gonna hide behind this quarry. They won't see me, and I'm gonna smell them. We've got more coming on. We've got a nice calf and mother in front, 12 o'clock. Some more coming. A young boy approaching from the right. Here we go, here we go. Hello, boy. Marianne, you're saying, did you get that, Owen? Oh, it's sweet elephants. Very sweet. This is actually one of the nicest elephant sightings I've actually had in a while. They're just so relaxed. I've been in the drainage, eating all the delicious food. Our monitor unless there's fallen asleep. <laughs> we'll show you him in just a moment because because <laughs> the elephants are going to disappear. <laughs> this is pretty special. And we spotted this herd solely based on vegetation moving. We didn't actually see an elephant for a while. We just saw the trees going boing, 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 boing.
that's the best piece of the Ellie's gone. But Mr. Rock Monitor is still here. Did you enjoy that? I did. <laughs> It's so cute, you know, you wouldn't think that reptiles would be cute, but they absolutely are. <laughs> what an absolutely wonderful sighting that was. How city was the was the Friday, my darling? Was the Friday? This is that one I don't know if you've seen. Guys, guys make so far of the leaves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hey, my sweetie, was the Friday? Langali moni. Wildlife trafficking remains a growing problem in South Africa and often made worse by the way the media portray this complex issue. WESA, the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, in partnership with WWF South Africa and supported by USAID, have recently embarked on a program whereby they train reporters to better tell stories of wildlife trafficking. In my community, Wildlife conservation is mostly something other people do, and I would like to change that. My name is Iman Singhi. I told people I met that the pangolin is one of the most trafficked animals on the planet. But what is a pangolin, they said. Why is it in danger? This is what made me decide that the pangolin story must be told. If we are to play a part in preventing the extinction of this animal, then we must all be part of the battle. A partnership between WWF South Africa and WESA, supported by USAID. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. We've repositioned, and it actually works in our favor anyway, signal-wise, and we get much better views of the elephants. And I've mentioned this quite a few times, and it's, it didn't come from me, it came from Rexon, but he said they're not destroyers, they are creators, and I really just love that. It's all about changing your perspective. And Rexon does a lot of the work here now that Juma's changed the structure a little. Rexon does a lot of the work at protecting the marulas and putting the sort of wire mesh around all the trees. And... Although you don't want to prevent elephants from getting their food, there's also a sort of mechanism and algorithm behind it, if you like, where he knows the land better than anyone. I mean, Rexham was brought up here. This is, this is his home. And he understands the movements of the elephants, why they're ring barking, what trees he do ring bark, and how to selectively choose specific trees to protect that'll still protect not only those trees but the integrity of the land around it and that's that's a lot of his work now he does that and it just deters the elephant it doesn't harm them it doesn't hurt them their food is plentiful we're not in a drought we're in the most lush giving season with water everywhere so they don't need the bark they don't need to do that and that's why we do protect them in the area, but they are not destroyers, they are creators. They create new things in so many ways. They're the architects, engineers, 
change in the land, not to destroy it, but to create something new. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful way of looking at it. Megan Edwards, you're seeing such pretty visuals. That's all down to OD, not me. He's the one with the skill behind the camera. I guess the elephants are helping. <laughs> I mention this all the time, but Owen just reminded me that a lot of guides will about identifying the matriarch. And I think some guides are a bit too quick. So ah, that's the matriarch. But really, there's a lot more to it than just being the oldest female or therefore the largest. That's not always the case. And in that beautiful book that I always, always recommend, Beyond Words by Carl Safina, it's broken into elephants, orcas, and wolves. And it's wonderful, it's quite heavy at points, but it's wonderful, and it really does go into great detail about elephant societies, how they communicate, how they structure themselves, and it's all about social units. Basically, the matriarch isn't always just the biggest female, and you've got to be really careful at presuming who it is. Sometimes it is obvious, but really, when it comes to science, you've obviously got to be very conclusive. And in identifying the matriarch, you should always wait, you should always observe how you really are going to identify is not because she's the biggest female, no, is by the social interactions. You need to just watch and see who they all gravitate around, who are they reacting to, who are they responding to, who's the one that's sort of keeping her eye on the rest of the herd. She might not always be the big female at the front, she might just be that slightly follow smaller yet older female right at the back observing everybody. So sometimes it is obvious, but I think some people are just a bit too quick to see us in matriarch. You've really got to watch who they're responding to, who they are gravitating around. After all, the matriarch is key to everybody's survival. She is the one that is gonna lead the herd from success to success. She's responsible for the reproductive success of the whole herd. Yes, so oldest elephant, so therefore should be the biggest, but it's just not always the case, and you should be careful when you're trying to identify the matriarch. Involved in the hair than any other, but it might not be immediately obvious. Calves will always be with their mothers, and the matriarch herself will have calves, but she will be involved in the herd and the decisions that are made more than any other individual. Sometimes in kinship groups, or if there's been a loss, a death of a matriarch, a new one will arise. It's not always the right one, and it's not always the oldest one, and it's not always the correct one. And what I mean by that is the book Beyond Words goes into great detail about how each individual elephant has its own personality. We can see that. And not all females are just destined to be the the matriarch is just not always it's just not who they're destined to be just like we all have our own destiny some of them have not got what it takes to be a matriarch and that's why sometimes the wrong female will arise take that position she's a bit too young maybe with not enough knowledge or she just wasn't meant to be a matriarch and at the end of the day she won't lead the herd to success and it can be so detrimental even fatal to some elephants. I think that's that herd moving off now, I'm afraid. I can try and see if we can catch up with others around the corner. I think they've gone off into the drainage line. Uh. Okay, OD, let's do a bit of a U-turn here.
the cameraman acts as your your mirrors, your side mirrors, because you can't see anything behind you. Good afternoon and welcome back to Eco Training Pridelands. Uh, we started off our afternoon with actually doing some tracking before we went live onto show. So we spent some half an hour looking for a specific lion. However, we thought that he actually moved into adjacent property. Luckily, he did come back. He most likely came back to come and look for a drink. We're just so happy to actually be able to locate on him. It's also interesting that he's actually moved in quite a warm part of the day, as we generally don't find lions moving in the heat of the day. We also will notice that he's also quite often yawning, which possibly indicates that he's going to get up. That is precisely what he's doing. Quite often when cats start yawning, they're actually fueling their muscles with oxygen so that they can actually start moving. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle and see what he's getting up to. Most likely, as he is a territorial male, he might start scent marking this and it's precisely what he did. He walked up to the closest tree, turned his bum towards the tree and sprayed urine against it quite often that is also followed by scuffing so we are in a sighting with a number of other vehicles as it's a shared sighting so you might hear different voices you also might make the uh, communicate with other vehicles okay. just wanted to get permission but it's fine that we can go ahead so when we do share sightings we do it on the basis that the person that locates it first as the one that can spend the most time of it and we'll also get a second and a third vehicle in so that we don't unnecessarily pressurize the animal once one of those vehicles move out then we'll make space for the first standby and there after the second standby when another vehicle has moved off one of the things I do find particularly funny about lions is that they can swim particularly well, but for some reason they don't like getting their feet wet. You can see he's actually focused on walking into the center of that muddy area rather than walking directly through the two little ruts that's been created in the middle of the road, on the side of the road. There we go, there's busy spraying again. For them, it's very important that they do spray their territory regularly. It's not the only way that they demarcate territories. They also do so by means of interdigital glands between the feet and also by rubbing their cheeks onto objects. And this just tells other male lions that they have to stay out of their territory, otherwise they will face the consequences. In this case, it's only a single male that runs the territory over here. If there is a group of males that potentially can come over here, they're very likely to actually displace him. It's also interesting that females actually prefer males in terms of coalition males rather than a single male, as if they know that there's less chance that they're going to lose their young when there's a territorial takeover and the cubs might be killed. Let's going to position the vehicle over here. Absolutely stunning light at the moment with this last little bit of light and it's actually just lifting those beautiful colours in the lion's mane out as well. Mm. Let's just listen to him, he's busy contact calling them. That's absolutely awesome. So Mundas, good afternoon and welcome back to the show. And um, I just want to quickly answer your question. Can they move freely? Yes, they can move freely into the Balule. And the Balule is also open to the Kruger National Park. Quickly taking a nap and regaining some energy. 
something that in there. I think it's all those flies around his face, which is hindering him. Wild Earth is offering you a chance to win unique, never-before-seen t-shirts while playing an Animal ID game on our new Discord channel. Sign up for free and click on Games to find the Animal ID game. Every time an animal is posted by a mod, you guess the species and in some cases the individual animal's name. The fastest correct answer will be put into a draw to win a t-shirt that cannot be bought anywhere. Prizes will be awarded every single day. Head over to our Discord channel now and join the Animal ID fun. BirdLife South Africa, our country's only dedicated bird conservation organization. They have been very successful in a number of areas, including the conservation of more than 150,000 hectares of grasslands and estuary habitat, saving thousands of albatrosses in trawl and longline fishing, and training community bird guides as ambassadors for nature in rural areas. Celebrating their official 25th anniversary, they are sharing 25 of their top success stories across their social media platforms. BirdLife South Africa is currently striving towards the conservation of 132 bird species that are heading for extinction. If we conserve birds, we will protect other biodiversity and important habitats that provide clean water and clean air for humans. Their work is forever ongoing. People who love birds can become a member of BirdLife South Africa or make a donation towards a bird conservation project. This warthog is in big trouble. He's got elephants all around. What are you going to do there, big guy? What are you going to do? Oh, he's pretty brave though. Oh man, he's not even moving. Look, that elephant is trying his best, but that warthog ain't budging. That's madness. That's so funny. And we have a winner. The Warthog wins the standoff. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth Daily. My favorite animal is a leopard, purely because I just think they are just the epitome of feline grace and power and the way they can move about in any environment and remain hidden until they want to be seen. I just find it incredibly intoxicating and they're amazingly beautiful. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. Good morning and welcome back to Eco Training Pridelands. I'm talking very softly because we've got a group of dwarf mongoose in front of us and they do disturb quite quickly at times if you are talking either too loud or make sudden rapid movements. What you'll also notice is that there's a red-billed hornbill that's sitting very close by to them and he's been following them as if they are disturbing insects. And they often do so and in a mutualistic relationship. We also find that this relationship extends to yellow-billed hornbills. And I've seen yellow-billed hornbill actually doing this also in the Kalahari, following meerkats, which is one of the close relatives to a dwarf mongoose. So in Southern Africa, out of all the mongoose species, there's only four of them that are social. And the dwarf mongoose, being our smallest of the mongoose species, is one of those four social species. And in this case, we also find that the group is led by an alpha male and female. And the alpha female in this case is also 30% larger than the others. That's very few species of animals where I know that we have a matriarchal society. And that also includes elephants. Let's see what they're going to get up to. They also tend to be very, very curious. Actually, when it comes to these little uh, predators, they're also incredibly effective little hunters. And I've actually once or twice seen them taking small little mammals together, and that means little mice. And in the past also, where I watched four of them actually pulling a bat out from underneath a log and killing it and devouring it. I reckon they're as effective as the African wild dogs that we saw this morning. One of the things that we'll also notice with them is that they move around within a territory and what they will do is they try and move through their territory in approximately 27 a day average. And the reason why is that's the duration of what their scent lasts. And if they don't demarcate their territory by means of scent, that will tell other groups of dwarf mongoose that the area is not occupied and then they will try and take her territory over. Uh, 
that's a little trick that I was learned, taught by my trackers many years ago. If you do want to get the attention of a dwarf mongoose, you can just imitate a call that sounds something like this. Let's see if it works. wide range of different calls that indicate different things but this seems to be one of the contact calls that they use and already two of them is coming a little bit closer let's see what they get up to when it comes to imitating calls of animals I do believe that it's fair game if you can attract animals such as a wild dog or a lion or a dwarf mongoose by imitating the call. However, you should never be using electronic methods actually of calling up animals. And you also should be doing it very, very sparingly when you are going to imitate, imitate the calls as you don't want to upset the animals and alter their behavior in any other manner. Years ago, we actually noticed a guy that was playing a call of a lion from his vehicle on his mobile phone, and that infuriated the two big male lions that were moving down the road, and they thought that there was an intruder in their territory, and that the intruder was inside their vehicle. So you have to really, really be careful with doing things like that, as it's not fair on the animal either. also comes to playing calls for birds um, as a bird guide we were taught to also use calls very sparingly we also were taught to play them very soft and in general when we do play those calls we will play them roughly at 20 seconds intervals and after the third attempt of playing it we stop playing it either means that the bird is not going to respond or or the bird is not there. Quite often we find that birders tend to overplay in areas which leads to the birds no longer responding to that call either. A few other important things when it does come to using electronic methods of calling up birds it's also not to do it in a breeding season as and when they are close to nest as this can often break up a pair or that's busy nesting in that area or force the male to move off and the reason why we play those calls incredibly soft is that that male can think that it's a much more dominant and more intimidating male that's being calling Something else that we were also taught in terms of call-ups when it comes to birds is when you are playing specifically for owls, you always start off with your small owls and then progressively move up towards your larger owl species, which you can find in that area. And the reason is and the smaller owls often are predated on by the larger owls and that will be intimidated by the sounds of that more dominant and larger owl species. For me, I personally prefer to Im imitate bird calls myself and rather see if I can call them out. Sometimes what I will do or so is if I can't imitate that specific species, I'll simply use the calls of a pool spotted owlet. And by imitating the owl, you also not mainly see that there's a number of birds that will come and investigate to see what is going on. I also will use some generally general alarm calls, which is, sounds like something like shh, 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 and that also Good afternoon and welcome to Eco Training Prudence. At the moment, we're looking at a wasp that has just caught a bee in midair. And now we're watching it as it's going to slowly start eating it. We're also going to just want to watch if it's actually going to eat it or if it's actually going to lay an egg inside it and then deposit it somewhere else. And we often do find that a lot of wasp species.